Hi everyone. Thanks so much for supporting our books, authors and your local bookshop over the past year. I'm Gillian Redfern. I'm Marcus Gipps, the Publishing Director of Galantz and the SF Gateway. I'm Rachel Winterbottom. I'm Claire Ormsley Potter. I'm Brendan. We're delighted to welcome you all to Galantz Fest at home. We're celebrating Galantz's 60th anniversary and throughout the day you'll hear from new and mainstay Galantz authors discussing all things SFF. You can download a sampler full of previews for a host of titles. You can get all sorts of ebooks dirt cheap as part of our weekend sale. And you can now get hundreds of classic science fiction titles on the new dedicated SF Gateway app. And you can join in our quiz to see if you really know your Dumbledores from your biases. Don't forget to use the hashtag Galantzfest at home. Now, enjoy the day. Thank you very much for joining us. Hello, Galantz Fest. I am sorry I can't be with you. Um, these are very odd times we're living through, and uh, I think everyone would rather I stay where I am and you stay where you are. So we're doing this digitally, and I'm going to read to you from the prologue of Rhythm of War. So I hope you guys enjoy, I hope you're having a good time, and I hope to see you when everything gets a little safer for travel. Prologue to Pretend. Seven years ago. Of course the Parshendi wanted to play their drums. Of course Gavilar had told them they could. And of course, he hadn't thought to warn Navani. Have you seen the size of those instruments? Maratham asked, running her hands through her black hair. Where will we put them? And we're already at capacity after your husband invited all the foreign dignitaries. We can't. We'll set up a more exclusive feast in the upper ballroom, Navani said, maintaining a calm demeanor, and put the drums there with the king's table. Everyone else in the kitchens was close to panicking. Assistant cooks, cooks running one direction or the other, pots banging, anticipation spread shooting up from the ground like streamers. Gavilar had invited not only the high princes, but their relatives and high, every high lord in the city. And he wanted a double-sized beggar's feast. And now, drums? We're, we've already put everyone to work in the lower feast hall, Maratham cried. I don't have the staff to. There are twice as many soldiers as usual loitering around the palace tonight, Navani said. We'll have them help you set up. Posting extra guards, making a show of force, Gavilar could always be counted on to do that. For everything else, he had Navani. Could work, yes, Maratham said. Good to put those louts to work rather than having them underfoot. We have two main feasts then, all right? Deep breaths. The short palace organizer scuttled away, narrowly avoiding an apprentice cook carrying a large bowl of steaming shellfish. Navani stepped aside to let the cook pass. The man nodded in thanks. The staff had long since stopped being nervous when she entered the kitchens. She had made it clear to them that doing their jobs efficiently was recognition enough. Despite the underlying tension, they seemed to have things well in hand now, though there had been a scare earlier when they'd found worms in three barrels of grain. Thankfully, Bright Lord Amaran had stores for his men, and Navani had been able to pry them out of his grip. For now, with the extra cooks they'd borrowed from the monastery, they might actually be able to feed all the people Gavilar had invited. I'll have to give instructions on who is to be seated in which feast room, she thought, slipping out of the kitchens and into the palace gardens, and leave some extra space in both. Who knows who else might show up with an invitation? She hiked up through the gardens toward the side doors of the palace. She'd be less in the way and wouldn't have to dodge servants if she took this path. As she walked, she scanned to make sure all the lanterns were in place. Though the sun hadn't yet set, she wanted the Kolinar Palace to shine brightly tonight. Wait, was that Asadon 
her daughter-in-law, Elkar's wife, standing near the fountains. She was supposed to be greeting the guests inside. The slender woman wore her long hair in a bun, lit by gemstones of each shade. All those colors were gaudy together. Navani preferred a few simple stones themed to one color, but it did make Aesodon stand out as she chatted with two elderly ardents. Storms bright and brash. Was that Rushu Chris, the arth who, <clears throat> the artist and matter, master art of Fabrian? What did, when had he arrived? Who had invited him? He was holding a small box with a flower painted on it. Could that be one of his new Fabrials? Navani felt drawn toward the group, all their thoughts fleeing her mind. How had he made the heating Fabrial, making the temperature vary? She'd seen drawings, but to talk to the master artist himself, Aesodon saw Navani and smiled brightly. The joy seemed genuine, which was unusual, at least when directed at Navani. She tried not to take Aesodon's general sourness toward her as a personal affront. It was the prerogative of every woman to feel threatened by her mother-in-law, particularly when the girl was so obviously lacking in talents. Navani smiled at her in turn, trying to enter the conversation and get a better look at the box. Aesodon, however, took Navani by the arm. Mother, I had completely forgotten about our appointment. I'm so fickle sometimes. Terribly sorry, ardent Chris, but I must make a hasty exit. Aesodon tugged Navani forcefully back through the gardens toward the kitchens. Thank Kalek you showed up, mother. The man is the most dreadful bore. Bore, Navani said, twisting to gaze over her shoulder. He was talking about gemstones and other gemstones and spren and boxes of spren and storms. You'd think he would understand. I have important people to meet. The wives of high princes, the best generals in the land, all come to gawk at the wild parchment. Then I get stuck in your gardens talking to Ardents. Your son abandoned me there, I'll have you know, when I find that man. Navani extricated herself from Aesodon's grip. Someone should entertain those Ardents. Why are they here? Don't ask me, Aesodon said. Gavilar wanted them for something, but he made Elikar entertain them. Poor manners, that is, honestly. Gavilar had invited one of the world's most prominent artifabians, prominent artifabrians to visit Kolinar, and he hadn't bothered to tell Navani? Motion stirred deep inside of her. A fury she kept carefully penned and locked away. That man, that storming man, how could he, how? Anger spren, like boiling blood, began to well up in a small pool at her feet. Calm, Navani, the rational side of her mind said. Maybe he intends to introduce the Arden to you as a gift. She banished the anger with effort. Brightness, a voice called from the kitchens. Brightness, Navani, oh please, we have a problem. Aesodon, Navani said, her eyes still on the Ardent, who is now walking toward the monastery. Could you help the kitchens in whatever they need? I'd like to. But Aesodon was already hurrying off toward another group in the gardens, one attended by several powerful High Lord generals. Navani took a deep breath and shoved down another stab of frustration. Aesodon claimed to care about propriety and manners, but she'd insert herself into a conversation between men without bringing her husband along as an excuse. Brightness, the cook called again, waving to her. Navani took one last look at the ardent, then set her jaw and hurried to the kitchens, careful not to catch her shirt on the ornamental shale bark. What now? Wine, the cook said. We've, we're out of the clavendaw and the ruby bench. How? She said, we have reserve. She shared a look with the cook, and the answer was evident. Dalinar had found their wine stores again. He'd grown quite ingenious at secretly draining the barrels for himself and his friends. She wished he'd dedicate himself half as much to the kingdom's needs. I have a private store, Navani said, pulling her notebook from her pocket. She gripped it in her safe hand through the sleeve as she scribbled a note. I keep it in the monastery with Sister Talana. Show her this, and she'll give you access. Thank you, Brightness, the cook said taking the note. Before the man was out the door, Navani spotted the house steward, a white-bearded man with too many rings on his fingers, hovering in the stairwell to the palace proper. He was fidgeting with the rings on his left hand. Bother. What is it? She asked, striding over. High Lord, <clears throat> High Lord Ryan Hatham has arrived and is asking about his audience with the king. You remember, his majesty promised to talk with Ryan tonight about, about the border dispute on the misdrawn maps. Yes. Vani said, sighing. And where's my husband? Unclear, Brightness, the steward said. He was last seen with Bright Lord Amaram and some of those uncommon figures. That was the term the palace staff used for Gavilar's new friends, the ones who seemed to arrive without warning or announcement and who rarely gave their names. Navani ground her teeth. 
thinking through the places the Gavilar might have gone. He would be angry if she interrupted him. Well, good. He should be saying to his guests rather than assuming she'd handle everything and everyone. And fortunately, at the moment, she, well, she would have to handle everything and everyone. There we go. Rhythm of War is out now. I hope that you guys have enjoyed reading it. And as I said, I hope to make it back to the UK eventually uh, to see you all in person and sign your books. Until then, uh, thank you so much for reading. Hello, I'm Edward Cox and welcome to this online Galantzfest Spectacular. I hope you're safe and healthy and muddling through these strange and troubled times of ours. So it's Galantz's 60th birthday this year. Fancy that. Happy birthday, Galantz. I haven't baked you a cake, sadly, but I do have the first chapter for my new book, The Would Be Queen. As yet, the book uh, doesn't have a cover, but I'm hoping it will do by the time this goes out. And somebody far cleverer than me at Galantz uh, will flash it up here or maybe flash it up here. Um, the book is out in June, and this is the first chapter, A Dream of Wolves and Dragons. They say that in the realm, the sea is in the sky. May liked to wander the streets at night, in the small hours when others were sleeping. She found solace in the quiet, peace in the dark. The air was fresher than it was during the day, salty from the sea, not choked by the fumes of automobiles. She had spent years travelling from place to place, enjoying the wind on her face, the open sky over her head, and the honest earth beneath her back. But it was here, in the town of Strange Ground by the Ski, where her travels had finally ended, where she had at last come to feel at home, even though her true home lay so very far away. Ambling through a balmy night in the height of summer, May headed to her favourite nocturnal spot. She veered off from the sodium glow suffusing the main road, cutting down an alley to a residential area where the communal hum of electric fans came from wide open bedroom windows. She smiled to herself, sadly. The townsfolk had adopted May as something of a curiosity. The wise old woman of the streets, they called her, not quite a celebrity, but certainly a mystery for gossips to discuss. She had many acquaintances among the earthlings, could claim to have at least one good friend, but none knew the truth of why May had adopted them. Strange ground by the ski was so close, yet so far away from her real home. But the town's lack of magic made it the perfect place to hide, or had done once. Finally, May reached a horseshoe of small apartment buildings curving round a little private garden. Although the garden was fenced in by black iron railings and locked at night, the gate opened with a squeak at May's touch and welcomed her inside. Comforted by the smell of flowers and freshly watered soil, she sat on the solitary bench to contemplate a worry which had begun while she slept during the day. Terrible visions had plagued May's dreams. Nightmares of a dark empress who had commanded the foulest magic of the underworld, who had led a dragon horde into battle against the revolt of giant wolves. Once upon a time, the wolves had been loyal allies to the dragons, but now they were mortal enemies and these two supernatural armies fought across the land without remorse or mercy. Innocent people died in their tens of thousands as the battle bathed their world in blood and fire. In the dream, May knew she had been given the power to stop the senseless destruction, but she didn't use it and awoke feeling disturbed by her decision, restless thoughts dominated by the home from which she had walked away. The friends and family she left behind, the ones who had, she had never said goodbye to, May missed them all dearly, and it was only natural that they should cross her mind from time to time. But never had, her qu had she questioned her decision to leave them, and never had they arrested her attention with as much force as they now did. Strange ground by the ski was full of bad omens on this night. The sky was clear and bright with stars, yet the silvery glow of the moon rippled like a reflection in a pond. 
beneath the taste of brine, a light breeze carried the scent of something wild, filled with desire and pursuit. A thin mist had begun forming on the ground like smoke sighed from the mouths of sleeping dragons. The atmosphere trembled as though warning of wolves on the hunt. There was magic in the air. Startled by the sudden flapping of wings, May watched the gull swoop down to land on the bench's armrest. It cocked its head to one side and considered the elderly woman staring at it. Hello there, little thing, May said. You gave me a fright. She noticed the message tied to the gull's leg with some concern. You must have travelled a long way to deliver this. The gull offered no resistance as May untied the scrap of paper and read the message upon it. The words were few, but stopped her heart. We have failed. Come home. May's eyes welled, but a small sob was barely out of her mouth before she gasped. The wild smell of hunting wolves assorted her nostrils with vigour, stronger, closer, announcing they had picked up their prey scent. Crushing the note in her fist, May jumped to her feet and held out a hand to the goal. No time for tears, little thing. It seems you were followed tonight. The goal hopped onto her arm and then up onto her shoulder. Hurrying through the night, May took the shortest route to her dwelling. It wasn't much, a recess most would overlook a nook between two buildings on the high street, but it kept May dry from rain and sheltered from snow, and it was lined with cardboard and blankets donated by kind townspeople. The mist had thickened by the time she arrived, and it carried a haunted chill. I'm afraid I have no food to offer you, she said, placing the gold down on the floor. This will have to suffice. She picked up a paper cup, removed the plastic lid and swirled the soured remnants of hot chocolate. My friend bought it for me. Sadness grew inside her. He brings me a hot chocolate every day. I wish I could return his kindness better than I now have to. May shivered and placed the cup before the goal. There, that should give you the strength for the return trip. And return you must, little thing, this very night. While the gull dipped its head to the chocolate, May searched among her belongings at the rear of the nook until she found a pencil. Forgive me, she hastily scribbled on the back of the original note. I am undone. You know what to do. The gull was still supping on cold hot chocolate when May tied the message to its leg. She lifted the bird, kissed its head, then stepped from the nook. Fly hard from this world, little thing, she told it. Do not stop until you reach the realm. And she threw the gull into the air. With a burst of wings, it soared high and away. May re-entered her nook and once again rummaged through her belongings. A decade ago, back when she lacked, lacked the strength to do what needed to be done, she had entered into a pact with a divine grace no longer worshipped on earth. Such packs were everlasting, never forgotten, and the ears of the divines could hear all places. May found the pact and carefully unwrapped it from the dusty old rag that kept it safe. It came in the form of a spell contained in a glass vial, its every detail floating in clear liquid. May shook it and awakened the magic to a blue glow. Here was a promise. Here was a duty. Out on a pavement, May crushed the vial beneath the heel of her boot. There was a hiss, a puff of steam, and then five streaks of ghostly blue sped away from her position. Three raced off into the town, two shot up into the sky. For my granddaughters, for my friends and for the realm, May said, as the spell disappeared among stars and watery moonlight, like silent fireworks. Lady Juno... Remember your servant's sacrifice and honour the promises you made. A growl emanated from across the high street. A wolf emerged from the mist, stalking between two parked cars into the orange glow of street lights. Mangy, black and silver, the beast was closely followed by a second. May stepped backwards into her nook. Only now did her nightmare make sense. How had she not seen this coming? Ten years ago, I would have given you a good fight, she said, curling her lip. The wolves crept closer, growling, hackles raised. Tell my daughter that her mother's ghost will forever haunt her. And the hunters leapt at their prey. 
What happens next? Well, you can find out in June when the would-be queen comes out from Galantz. Have a marvellous rest of the day, everybody. Thank you for listening. And big, lovely, happy birthday to Galantz. Bye. Mwah. Hi everyone, I'm Nalini Singh and I'm going to be reading from Quiet in Her Bones, my latest thriller. Uh, set in New Zealand, this book is about Nina Rai, who vanished 10 years ago along with a quarter of a million dollars. And everyone just kind of wrote it off like a trophy wife who got sick of her life and decided to start again. Um, and that's everyone except her son, who never believed that his mother would just leave him. And as the book opens, Nina's remains have just been discovered in a forest down the road from uh, the exclusive gated community where she used to live. And it's obvious that she's been there um, since the night she vanished. And um, her son Arif is determined to find out what happened to his mother. So the part I'm going to read is from quite close to the beginning of the book. So I hope you enjoy this glimpse um, into quite a new bones. My hands tightened on the steering wheel as my father got into the passenger seat. We didn't speak, my eyes on the unmarked police vehicle up ahead, driven by Constable Neri. It led us out of the leafy gilded surrounds of the cul-de-sac and onto a long and winding road bordered by the dense forests of the Waitakiri Rangers Regional Park, with only small hamlets of habitation along the way, and glimpses of breathtaking vistas where the foliage opened up. Scenic Drive lived up to its name, but only if you weren't expecting pretty and safe. All that rich green turned parts of the road claustrophobic. It was never searing hot here, not in the cool darkness of the shadows cast by the forest giants. This was a quiet place, a place that whispered that humanity was an intrusion that would be swiftly forgotten after we were gone an unexpected flash of white, a large sign at the entrance to a trail warning that the area was under a Rahui because of Kari dieback disease. No one was permitted to go on those trails because the disease spread through the forest on the soles of human shoes, bringing a slow death to trees meant to grow far older than my mother would ever be. I followed the police car knowing that if it stopped anywhere on this road, It'd be a spot I'd driven past hundreds of times, passing my mother's grave over and over again. The unmarked car slowed as it turned a corner, and when I followed, I saw flashing lights and cones and an orange vested officer waiting to direct traffic through what had become a single narrow lane, one of the darkest sections of the road and of the forest. The land dropped off precipitously to my right, but not into emptiness. Into bush dense and thick and impenetrable to the human eye. Ancient cowry trees, nikau palms, huge tree firms, this landscape was theirs. Constable Neri brought the police vehicle to a stop behind a van and I pulled in behind her. Everyone waited while I got the crutches from the back seat, no one speaking. Armpit snug, armpits <laughs> snugged into the tops of the walking aids. I nodded, and the cops led us to a part of the road that had no safety barrier against the fall into the green. I couldn't remember if it ever had. The car was found at the foot of this incline, Regan told us. Nose down. That fit my father's theory of it sliding off the road and down the steep slope into the devouring forest. I wanted to dispute the idea of my mother driving off the road on a rainy night, such a neat and tidy end to everything. But, but she had drunk too much, as long as I could remember, and she could be a reckless driver. Of course, if I were the one writing the story, I'd use those very things to cover up a murder, cover up a scream. So that was from Quiet in Her Bones, and um, I hope it entices you to keep reading on.
Hi guys. Hi. Hi. Hi everyone. It's uh, it's nice to finally put some face of the names. Some of you, uh, I mean, I I'm Louise's editor, but this is genuinely the first time I'm actually having a face to face conversation with us. So this very nice is my confirmation you. that you exist. But, <laughs> I know. You know. I wasn't sure up until now. I could have been just a stooge, you know. Who knows? Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it's nice to meet you all. I have had uh, some chats and emails with you before, so hopefully I'm not some strange weirdo in time to see you. But uh, well, this is your panel, so I'll try and stay in the background as much as possible. Uh, so basically, um, I thought it would be nice if we started with you guys introducing yourselves and telling us the title of your book. I have no idea idea what order you're displayed on in your own screens so i thought as arbiter of the zoom how about i prompt you according to how you're displayed on my screen and we'll commit to that sort of order as well all sound good yeah, yeah. Sounds, sounds good sounds good so, the lance davies panel so susanna would you mind starting us off yes so i <laughs> hello caller i'm susanna wise and my debut is called this fragile earth great and louise uh, hi, I'm Louise Carey. Um, my debut is called Inscape. Adam? Uh, my name's Adam Simcox, and my debut is called The Dying Squad. And finally, Johnny. Uh, hi, I'm Jonathan Sims, and my debut is called 13 Stories. Thank you very much, guys. Right, so first question, let's kick it off. So for how many of you is this your first go at novel writing ever? Is that going to be none, or is it one? Uh, me. So you got one, one from Susanna. So basically, uh, I just wanted to know. Oh, sorry, it's, it's you, uh, as well, Johnny. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. Sorry, Susanna, please. Uh, basically, I just wanted to ask you all, um, depending on how experienced you are in writing already, um, what your journey has been like to get to this point. I think people would find it really interesting just to hear what goes into even making it to the point of being a debut author. Go go jump in. Anyway. Okay, um, I'll start if that's okay. I definitely, I definitely feel too old to be described as a debut anything. To be honest, too old and beaten. Um, but I, I had quite a long journey to this point. I guess I started in film. Um, so I made three. I wrote and directed three micro budget feature films. Um, and they, they did okay. They got the first one was sold to Netflix, but that was at the time when kind of. Like it, Netflix was in its inception. So if you had a good cat video, you'd probably get into Netflix at that point. Don't sell yourself short, man. <laughs> <laughs> but still available to buy and hire, so I do. Um, <laughs> and so and they, so I had kind of a little bit of success on the, the kind of film festival circuit, but it was always a bit frustrating because you were kind of, you were constrained by budgets really. They were really micro budget films. So I, I went, I tried to start writing novels where you, you're only constrained by your lack of talent or imagination. Um, but I, to get to this point, I wrote, I wrote three novels before The Dying Squad. Um, I had kind of, I had a few kind of full manuscript requests um, and a couple of close calls with agents, but it was with The Dying Squad that it seemed to, to kind of click. And was that the first time that you had submitted to your agent now. Uh, yeah, I. Sorry, I, I Is that the first time? That the first time you your agent seen of yours? Yeah. So I, um, the agent I ended up with, Harry Illingworth. He he was at a pitch night, and I kind of I identified early that he was someone I really wanted to represent me because I thought he would get it. So I pitched to him on that evening along with a lot of other people, and then when I came to submit, um, I think maybe like a month later. I had something I could reference saying, so, you know, we met at so and so, I pitched you that. So I think that definitely helped. I think that's anytime you can do something like that, it helps. Cool. Yeah. So, um, anybody else? What was their journey? Um, I had a, I mean, mine, I th it is my first uh, actual uh, novel that, I, that I've uh, written. You know, when I was younger, obviously, I made. A lot of abortive starts on all sorts of projects um but i actually started out um in performance uh doing the writing for a sort of um storytelling cabaret act uh, called the mechanisms 
um, and uh, 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 now a great friend of mine, um, Alex Newell, who was starting up a, a podcast network, uh, saw us at the Edinburgh Fringe and uh, said, hey, do you want to do a show? Um, and so I was uh, very into uh, sort of short horror fiction and like a lot of the uh, emerging uh, internet culture around um, horror and uh, storytelling. And obviously I came from a, a, this um, oral storytelling background. Uh, so I started a podcast called The Magnus Archives, which sort of kind of ballooned in popularity around season three. And, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, Rachel, uh, commissioning editor at, um, uh, at Orion, uh, approached me and uh, said that they were looking to expand their sort of uh, their horror offerings and uh, get some new voices on board. Uh, and uh, did I have did I have a novel I was trying to get published? To which the correct answer is obviously yes, absolutely. Just let me uh, <laughs> let me just go. Uh, go f fetch fetch those notes um and uh so yeah we we uh spent a while going back and forth and, and workshopping uh this because uh there was some specific stuff that they were looking for they wanted something that was audio focused and sort of um like smaller stories feeding together and with a, a very much a, a social uh social themes running throughout which was very much the sort of thing i've been doing uh, on Magnus and uh, yeah after a, a year year and a half of uh, hashing it out and uh, sending it back and forth um, we got 13 stories which I'm immensely proud of. It's super chilling uh, if you guys want to read it read it during the day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about you Lou? Um, yeah so I think I had quite an atypical journey into writing this first solo novel and again, it doesn't feel quite right to call me a debut because I've been co-writing since I was in my teens. Um, I wrote a graphic novel with my dad, and then I wrote a couple of fantasy novels with both my parents. Um, then I went and did my degree and then I did um, a second degree. Then I realized that I should stop trying to get a real job and I should continue writing novels. Um, so Inscape is my first sci-fi novel and my first solo novel, but it's not not really my my first novel. I'm a fraud debut. It's like the best apprenticeship you could have had though, isn't it? Yes, really, really good training. <laughs> How about you, Susanna? You're on mute, I don't know if you know. I muted myself, yeah, because I know that sometimes, because I laugh a lot and sometimes I snort when I laugh, so I thought I'd better mute myself because otherwise, <laughs> if you're on speaker view, then you'd get me and snorting, which would be. <laughs> So great. Um, uh, I um, have another um, self-employed career as an actor, um, which I've been doing for years and years. And uh, I had done quite a lot of writing of scripts and things, which um, never really got in, had a lot, you know, interest, and then they don't get made and whatever. Um, so I'd always loved writing, but in a, a short form prose or um, script format. I'd never written long form. My basically, I started writing this book in 2015 when I found out my dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer and I went to bed that night and had a sort of catastrophic fantasy about the worst thing that could possibly happen it was like a weird sort of childlike um lateral leap into my dad's dying but I'm not going to think about that I'm going to think about artificial intelligence robots instead <laughs> um, and I came up with this whole story in my head that night and it was sort of itching in my head to be written so I started writing it and I thought, oh, I'll probably just write a few thousand words and I'll stop. And I just couldn't stop writing it. I was doing a play at the time. So I was, I was working at the Young Vic and I was very busy, but I was like manically writing it in the day, then going to see my dad and myself and then going to do the play in the evening. And, um, and then once my dad died, like six months later, I just stuck, really committed to it and started writing it. So I'd written that novel. I tried to, I sent it off to some agents. I had quite a fair bit of interest but no, and people were sort of, some agents were even working with me on the manuscript, but hadn't offered me representation. Um, and this went on for quite some time. <laughs> and after about three years, I thought I'm going to do a writing course at the Faber Academy because I wanted to, I, I couldn't, people were saying it was really good, but nothing was sort of happening. I did the six month novel writing course. I wrote another novel um, that got put into an anthology, that, an extract of that, and an agent saw it and offered me representation based on that. Then she read this book 
and said, no, this is going to be your first book. And I was like, that's good because it's the first one I wrote. <laughs> so that's how, um, and in, the, in between times, I'd gone to um, a masterclass day at Galanx. Um, you can see where I was, uh, where I was pitching my interest, can you? <laughs> and sort yeah. of gone and met everyone and including you, actually, I think I met you there, although you probably don't remember, but anyway, yeah. um, I remember. And, um, and then, so my agent, uh, I asked her to send it to Marcus, the, the manuscript, and he said he would like to publish it. So that was, that was my route into publishing. I was very lucky. So you guys, uh, throughout what you've been saying, have sort of sort of touched upon agents and how they fit into things. So I was wondering if you guys <clears throat> maybe not discuss again how you found your agents, but how do you how have you found the triangular relationship that is you being the author, you having an agent and you having an editor? How do you find they all fit together and what's your experience been of that? Um, I, I found it interesting because <laughs> when you get to into your 40s, I think you've had most professional relationships you're going to have by that point. But with your age in particular, I think it's kind of a new relationship because you're their client, but they're kind of your boss in a way, particularly when you're at the point of working with a manuscript stage and getting it ready to send out. So I find it a really interesting dynamic. And I was very keen when I, I went to the... Um, Susanna mentioned you went to the Faber. I went to the Curtis Brown course, which is kind of a similar sort of thing. I was there for six months. They do, sorry, not to interrupt. Do they do a physical one and a digital one? Yeah, Which they one do. Was... They do. And I this was pre-COVID, so I, I did the physical one. And they, someone, I can't remember who said it, but it really stuck with me. They said, try and get someone that is vaguely your age, if not a bit younger, and is a hungry fighter. And that really stuck with me. I think there's really something to be said for that. Because obviously it's great to get a massive, massive kind of mega agent. It's also great to get someone who's got something to prove and which, you know, as a debut author, you know, you, I feel I've got something to prove and most debut authors do. So I think if you can get that, then it's a really good combination. Yeah, I was, I, 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 sorry, sorry, Ren. Uh, no, I was going to say, I, I, I totally agree with you, Adam. And I, um, I, I've had a lot of experience of agents because I have had acting agents all my life and I have one in America and one here and, you know, voiceover agent, this agent, I've got agents coming out of my ears. Um, and, and then to have then as well a literary agent. But I think literary agents are just, well, mine anyway. Um, I just absolutely love her. And it's a very different relationship to my acting agents, who are also lovely, by the way. But um, there's a much more intimate relationship. Um, it's a much gentler relationship. I think there's a lot less bullshit in the, well, from my perspective, there's a lot less <laughs> bullshit in the, literary world than there is in the um, film and w world. I don't know, Adam, whether you agree with that, but anyway. Um, um, but uh, yeah, so I've absolutely loved my relationship with my literary agent and um, I find her very um, respectful and, you know, um, it's been only a help and not a hindrance in any way, shape or form. But I totally agree with you, Adam, about A, the fact that they're sort of your boss, but you are, that you are their client, it's a weird dynamic. And, and B, that it's great to have someone, from my perspective, a little bit younger than you, really hungry with something to prove. I totally agree with you about that. So if an agent's your boss, how, what's an editor? How, does it, how do they fit in? Uh, <laughs> even more of a boss. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I, 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 love, I love editors. Uh, especially like, I mean, Rachel's brilliant, but I've, I mean, I've worked with uh, a bunch of editors throughout my career and I absolutely love them because you, you send off writing, you're like, oh, I think it's, it's it's fine. And then they'll send it back and you'll be like, oh yeah, no, this this makes it better. Brilliant. It's it's good now. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm actually like a yeah big fan of the, the editing process, especially because like once I've finished writing something, I often find myself kind of, word blind to it I'll, I'll read mm. through it and I'm like I have no idea how good this is anymore like uh, a Boris so, for the tree situation yeah exactly so like actually getting it back and being like oh okay yep no this bit needs to go this bit needs to be tightened we need something else there it's it's a really um it, it's a weirdly reassuring process uh for me uh, I feel a bit bad talking about agents to be honest because everyone else is, is talking about how sort of you know, uh, long it took or, or how, how hard it was and, and I, I found it 
uh, it's remarkably easy to get an agent if you already have a book deal on being offered. <laughs> uh, so it was very much like, hey, do you want to come in and, and negotiate this for me? Because it, it's here. Um, but no, I, I, I'm like, Zoe is absolutely fantastic. I've only actually met her twice in real life uh, because, well, obviously this year. pandemic. This year. Yeah, this, this year. Um, <laughs> But yeah, again, it's uh, it's what Adam was saying about uh, someone sort of at the same sort of stage as you. Like Zoe's also a massive nerd, uh, which is actually which was actually what something that like we met and we like started talking board games and just all this really niche stuff. Uh, and I was like, okay, yeah, no, this is this is the the relationship that that I want, and also so far a lot of her, her job has been just kind of like holding my hand because everything moves so much slower in um uh, like uh, you know actual industries you know in, in podcasting it's like okay cool we need this script by the end of the week then we're recording next week uh, and uh, you know maybe we'll have uh, like a few days editing and then it's out um whereas obviously in publishing you're talking in terms of, of months or, or years uh so a lot of it is just me being like is everything still okay I, I i haven't i haven't heard anything it's like yes yes everything everything is 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 just going as it does yeah it's, it, that, yeah i know it can feel a bit like turning a uh oil tanker in the ocean publishing just that's how far ahead people are looking yeah <laughs> how about you how about you Lou? how have you found the the relationship between you your agent and the editor I was going to say, I really relate to everyone who's been saying kind of agents are like your boss because my, my agent, um, Meg Davis uh, at the key agency was really instrumental in getting me to finish InScape after I came up with the idea. She was sort of like, you know, yes, this is good. Now you have to go and write it, go, go and write it now. And she would you know, send me little emails just being like, remember to actually kind of, you know, finish, finish the book, please. Um, when I wrote the first draft, I was juggling it with my masters and with a lot of volunteering work. And it was kind of easy to let it fall to the bottom of my to-do list. And having, I think just having somebody else who <laughs> liked the book and thought that it was a good idea and one that deserved to be written was immensely helpful because it's all very well kind of feeling like you've had a good idea. Having somebody else say, yes, this is good and it might sell. That made all the difference for me. I don't think I ever would have finished it if it hadn't been for Meg telling me that I should. And I think something that I really found quite unexpected about having an agent was that um, it's just nice how you get to kind of, um, like you were saying, Jonathan, how you get to sort of geek out about things together. When I went to my first kind of perspective, like speculative meeting with Meg, I thought it was going to be really stressful and she was going to ask me a bunch of difficult questions about, you know, where my book might fit in the market. And instead I was just like, this is my idea. And she was like, oh, that's really neat. That reminds me of, of this and this and this. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> and it was just a really fun chat about literature for like two hours. It was great. Cool. Well, I'm um... Can I just say one last thing? Because I, I feel like we haven't really talked about editors quite enough. We've talked a lot about agents. I just wanted to say one last thing. And that is when, because I'd never met any editors before. When I went to the Galanks workshop day, whenever it was a few years ago, I didn't have an agent at the time. So I had no representation and I'd never met an editor before. And the one thing that I was really struck by was how editors loved writing and writers. I know that sounds really obvious, but like it wasn't obvious to me. Having been dealing with agents for ages, like sending submissions and the sort of marketing of, of my book and the, and would it sell and what genre was it and everything. What I found is I was in this room with these people who just wanted to talk about writing and loved writing, were excited about the ideas and weren't thinking about, I mean, I'm, I know they do <laughs> but behind the scenes, but it felt like people who shared the passion for writing that I had and that was what was so brilliant. I got really excited. I felt so optimistic after I came away from that day um, because I suddenly realised editors are very light writers. Well, I mean, a lot of editors are also writers. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. uh, Rachel, uh, my editor, like while we were hashing out the details of 13 stories, her debut uh, came out. Um, so like, I, I think the, 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 there, there is a very mutable line between uh, editor and writer. And like, you know, on occasion I've done sort of some freelance editing work um, because yeah, often an editor's job is to be a second pair of eyes on, on a work as a writer and, you know, say, oh, I think these, these bits could use tweaking up. 
well, now that we are sort of uh, <clears throat> meandering into the technical process of writing your book and editing the book, I was wondering if you guys could tell me about, like, because you're all writing speculative fiction, right? So maybe maybe you could sort of give a little little overview about what your books are in the next thing. Um, and I wanted to know, given that you're writing speculative fiction, how do you go about getting in the headspace for your characters, dealing with things that are quite literally impossible and you yourself will never have encountered and you know you're never going to encounter, fingers crossed. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, for me, um... My book, is The Dying Squad, is about a spectral police force that solves crimes. It fle it's flesh and blood, police can't. Uh, and Joe Lazarus, who's the main character, uh, he's a policeman. He raids a drugs den at the start of the book, only to discover his own bleeding out body. And then he's recruited to The Dying Squad uh, by Daisy May, who's his teenage uh, partner, uh, to uncover who murdered him. So he has to solve his own murder. So it's High, high concepts. Um, in, in terms of the how I make it relatable, to me, it's kind of, I always thought of it as sort of line of duty crossed with rivers of London, a bit of ghost, but directed by Shane Meadows. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, really, I really love his stuff. And I, I tried to make it as gritty and as realistic as possible. So it's not, everything kind of there's a reason why everything happens everything's i guess as logical as the world dictates and it's it's set in the real world so the investigations always happen in the real living breathing world and that makes it easier i think or it did for me to kind of identify with it in picture um so 13 stories uh is a it's a haunted house book, but uh, it's a haunted tower block, essentially. Uh, this ultra-modern development, uh, Banyan Court, that has um, a certain a certain portion sort of set aside as uh, like affordable housing, but the back half where that is is almost completely segregated. It's much more like run down, like where a lot of corners have been cut. And uh, it follows um, it follows 13 people, 13 it's also 13 stories high yeah. so you know it's, it's 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 very it's very clever uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, sorry uh and uh, it, it follows 13 people who live or work um with the building as they each uh encounter some sort of shade or haunting that all leads up to the um to a dinner party that they end, get, end up getting invited to uh, by billionaire Tobias Fell, uh, who you, you learn right at the beginning of the book uh, is horribly murdered, um, and uh, we discover how that happens, and uh, it's it, it's 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 pretty messed up. But how, how do you how do you how do you how do you manage to get into the right headspace to to write a, a convincing haunting? You know, um, I mean, to a certain degree, at this point, it's practice. Uh, I mean, like. Magnus Archives has been sort of about 200 short standalone horror stories so there's, there's a certain uh, it used to be quite difficult I'd need to like go for like long walks late at, late at night but I there is a certain way that it's, it's almost like a muscle that, that you build up just this uh, way that you sort of twist the world ever so slightly and you just honing in on uh, the specific aspect of a scene or, or an area and being like, oh, that's that's the bit that if you just shift it slightly out of place, it becomes very unsettling. Um, and also with horror, there's a certain, a lot of horror is about the rhythm, um, both of the, the words themselves and of the, the pacing. It's almost like, it's almost like music in some ways. And when you feel like you've got a handle on the the rhythm of a scene on the the crescendo and the tension um it becomes it, it sort of flows very easily i thought i didn't think you were going to say um practice at first i thought you were going to say you got to get a bit practical you know just go find 
Just go to just, just find, go some find a real haunted house. Yeah, just find some yeah. monsters, mate. Like, just I mean, they're, they're they're out there. Like, just like if you lift up a sewer grate, like one out of three times, something with way too many teeth. Yeah, there you go. Five minutes down there. Go back to the laptop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How about you, Luke? Yeah, I mean. I don't think it's a question I've ever asked myself, sort of how do I make things that couldn't actually happen feel believable? But then I think that's because I was always one of those kids growing up who was off in a fantasy world more often than I was inhabiting the real world anyway. So a lot of things that could never really happen felt very real and true to me when I was a kid. And that persisted in my writing as I got older. I think maybe... In, in InScape, so InScape's a, a sort of, it's set in this uh, future dystopia where corporations rule the world and it follows um, a young corporate saboteur and spy called Tanta, who's basically a ward of the corporation. So a big tech company has raised her since birth and molded her into this perfect sort of super soldier and spy. And she's got absolute loyalty to them. And she's sent out on her sort of first ever real field mission. And it's a total disaster. Uh, two of her colleagues die. Um, everything goes wrong and she's given this chance to redeem herself. She's paired with a much older partner and they're sent out um, into the field to try and recover the documents that were lost in this first disastrous mission. And it's about everything that sort of, um, it's sort of, it's a, it's a thriller um, that follows her journey as she tries to trace who stole the documents and what for. Um, and I think, you know, I didn't really find writing the, the future tech particularly difficult I think what I found like grounded it for me was a focus on the human and the emotional aspects of the book so obviously I will never have uh, the internet in a chip in my brain or I hope not um, like my protagonist <laughs> does but I found like but I found focusing on how she feels about the corporation that raised her how she feels about her job and the people that she meets that grounded it for me and made it always feel real which I, I hope comes across and she's also just kick ass. She's real kick ass, is Tanta. Yeah, those were the bits I found hard actually. Not not the things that couldn't happen, but the things that that technically could. So the sort of martial art scenes and the big action set pieces, I found that really hard to kind of research. I spent a lot of time on YouTube watching uh, videos of um, of martial arts matches and trying to sort of think my brain into how that would go because I'm not at all a physical person, um, yeah. and I've never been in a fight. <laughs> So that was hard to, to make believable, much harder than the futuristic tech and uh, and all of the things that is mu much more outlandish, really. Should have gone full method, Lou, and just gone and got yourself a black belt in karate or something. Oh, yeah, de <laughs> definitely a possibility for me. <laughs> sequels, sequels. <laughs> How about you, Suzanne? Um, so it's really interesting that you were saying that because I, I find that um, writing action sequences are so difficult, the, the idea of trying to describe action. So you don't want to tell too much, but also you've got to orient mm. the reader in the space and actually literally in the space in the case of some of these <laughs> novels um, in space. But or but, you know, if you're writing in a kind of um, imagined world, then it's even more important to try and orient the reader. But you are kind of flying blind with them at the same time. Um, and also what Lou said about being, um, feeling like reality was less real than your um, imagined world. I mean, I still have that. In fact, my second book deals with that a lot, um, which I've just sent to you, so you might read it. <laughs> um, but um, uh, I have always felt that my um, imagined world was, yes, felt much more tangible than, than this one. Um, so it wasn't hard to put myself into that situation. My book is actually quite different in the respect of when you said, Brendan, it's a future that could never happen. I feel like, well, mine is potentially a future that could happen. And I try to keep it as much rooted in the world that I already know and just shift it very slightly to the side. Um, so my book is about a protagonist, uh, Signe. It's set in an indeterminate amount of time, probably about 40 years in the future. Um, in London, um, starts in London. She has a six-year-old son um, who's really quite bright and a partner and they lead quite an ordinary life. And then um, utilities start to get cut off one by one, um, gas, electricity, water, solar power, and then communications go. Nobody really knows what's going on. Something really awful happens and she has to flee London with her son 
um, on a bicycle <laughs> um, and cycles mm -hmm. the Midlands to try and find her mother, um, who, who lives in a very remote part of the Midlands. Uh, and when she gets there, things are a lot worse than she imagined. <laughs> I won't spoil it. <laughs> um, I realised as I asked the question, I was like, oh, Susanna's going to be like, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, so mine uh, predominantly deals with um, the, the, not the, I won't say the dawn of artificial intelligence, obviously, because we're here, but quantum computing and um, the idea of coding and uh, where we could go with unprotected, unleashed uh, artificial intelligence. Um, I don't think it's that far beyond the realms of um, possibility. Some of the uh, things are, but um, a lot of the tech that I have in my book is repurposed tech. Um, so it's not like suddenly, you know, a beaming ship comes down and um, it's, it's stuff that's already within the world that I create. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed the world building actually. As well, to speak um, a little uh, to something you, you all mentioned a little while ago about action sequences. I think they're really quite hard to write because they're so visual and obviously to an extent, I mean, reading is a visual medium, but at the same time, you can't see what's going on. So I guess it becomes a real skill of not laboring the point with what's going on. And just hope and just sort of keeping the pace and not getting bogged down in, in the nitty gritty detail because you've got to trust the reader to sort of film the, film the scene in their head. Well, I find I action sequences. No, I, I, was, I was done, you go. I, I think there's, uh, again, it does, I think, touch on uh, what Lou said uh, before as well, that like a lot of the, the, more, the harder things to write are not the things that couldn't happen, but the things that absolutely could because the, the reader has expectations, the reader knows what that sort of thing should feel like, should look like. Um, and so catching that believability, especially in something like an action scene and matching it with uh, the, the, the rhythm is, is a very difficult thing. Um, it, <laughs> it reminds me that like the, you know, writing it, the, the hardest bit of writing 13 stories was doing research into plumbing. Um, because one of the characters is a plumber and a lot of his stuff is doing plumbing and I have, am not a plumber, don't know the first thing about plumbing, so that is a lot, lot more than I'm like, well you know, I can make a ghost do whatever I want but a plumber's got to do his job properly um, and you, hear, um, you hear a lot about people who read military fiction where people get yeah. details about gun do you imagine like a plumber reading the book no, being absolutely. like, no mate <laughs> absolutely, it's, it's um, Alex always says on um, like sound editing the podcast, it's that like oh if you want a ghost to come through the wall, slice someone's head off, and then like break through reality, that's fine. If you want someone to open a door and go into the next room, that's a lot harder because people know what that's supposed to sound like. You know that is something that can sound that will sound wrong to people if it's not if you don't get it perfect. Whereas a lot of the speculative stuff, you're working with things people have no expectation of, so that so they have no basis to be like oh well that's not that's not what that should be like actually funny enough one of the things that i've been quite concerned about <laughs> is that anyone who lives or knows london and particularly north london will know that i've taken some artistic license with some of the um directions that uh, <laughs> my, my protagonist and her son go on to get out onto the m1 um i mean really have so i'm worried that there's going to be people going oh that's not the way you get you don't go up left <laughs> You can already see those good read reviews, can't you? You can already see them. <laughs> These are the things that really keep you up at night as a writer, aren't they? I spent just hours on um, Google Maps Street View uh, doing research yes. for certain scenes in Inkscape, just being like, okay, what does this road actually look like? Because I was so paranoid. Well, about it. <laughs> or you'll describe a um, uh, house and then you'll look at it on Google Street View and you're like, oh no, this place has nothing that looks even remotely like yeah. that. <laughs> to like to, to sort of um look at a more bigger picture technical question um from the editing after you've written the book did you ha has have you come away from that experience with ideas for how you might approach a subsequent book like would you do you think your approach will change based on how you found your editing process the first time around or has it sort of 
convinced you that you, oh yeah you know what you're doing you're onto the right track with what you're what you're getting at or just how are you going to approach future things based on how things have gone i wrote the second book kind of when i was getting the notes for the first book and it definitely helped in certain aspects of the story like um i have reached as well as an editor and one of the big things she kept saying was like he's a detective make him detect and that definitely carried over into the second book into kind of you know you you would have a part of the story and he's like he discovers something but he's not really working it out so it made me go back and work harder on making him work harder to find it not just kind of put putting on the lap for him that was massively helpful the, the other part was i definitely had rachel's voice in my ear when i was writing something it's kind of like, is this good enough really this bit does this work it's kind of like <laughs> stress testing your work all the time in a really good way so very naively i think maybe there will be a little bit less stress testing to do on the second one because i've got rachel's voice in my head i could be completely wrong we'll see well i've i've already written my second book and i've already had some notes back from marcus which i've just as i said um attacked and resent so i'm waiting for the next <laughs> slew of <laughs> commentary um so i've done that and i'm actually writing a third book um at the moment so i'm i'm nearly finished a draft of, of a third novel which is much that the second book is not a sequel so it's, it doesn't bear any relation to the first one but the third book is much more in the same sort of i don't know what you'd call it jig i i can't find the right word i'm not going to say genre because it's it's not science fiction but it is like a it's like a horror science fiction book um the second it's one the same, it's in the not same not country if it's not on the same street is that it is on the same they're all in the same country <laughs> <laughs> how about you Luke? yeah i'm in quite a similar position to you susanna in that i wrote um the second book in the inscape trilogy um during the lockdowns last year and now i'm on to book three I would say that like a lot changed in my writing process from book one to book two, but most of the, th the changes were sort of practical things. So time changed because I had forever to write book one because I wasn't under a contract um, and um, nobody was kind of really asking me for it except my agent. So whereas book two, I had a deadline. So I wrote a lot more, I'd like to say efficiently, maybe panickedly would be more <laughs> accurate. <laughs> um, and of course, like when I wrote the first book, I, lockdown had a big impact on how I worked. I didn't think it would because I was already working from home, kind of writing and freelancing full time. But I never really realized until lockdown happened how much of my work I did in cafes. Um, it was really hard to just sit at my desk all day like a like a normal person. Um, <laughs> I missed, you know, being and I think also kind of going out for walks as thinking time. Um, I never realized how many good ideas I had just sort of wandering around, not doing anything very practical, but just thinking. So writing and being confined to home was a challenge, but an interesting one. I was actually, it was actually on my, on my list of questions to ask, how, you, how have you found 2020 and being confined has changed or impacted your creative process or your workflow? Have you found it yeah. difficult or have you found the headspace freeing or... Uh, I mean, it's been horrible, to be honest. <laughs> I'm actually uh, currently finishing up um, the second book. And like, I can feel like I can feel that sort of lockdown just fuzz uh, a lot of the time. And it's, it's, you, you're asking about sort of, uh, or how is the, the editorial process? And like, it, I think um, with my first, because they were set, they were separate uh, they were broadly separate though interconnected stories and a lot of the notes were about linking them together about getting it to feel like a, a single piece of whole and so that's something I've I've taken very much uh, into the second book which is much more like a sort of uh, following the same group of characters um, throughout uh, but the, the main one is, is just like okay this one uh, might need a bit more okay. editing because a lot of it has been uh, I mean Writing in lockdown is really hard because you just lose so much of the outside stuff that helps put your writing into context and into focus. 
Um, and yeah, like a lot of, so like, like Lou said, so much of it is just like sitting there for, for hours and hours and just putting down words and at the end being like, well, I hope those were some good words. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess, I guess you're given the time, oh, no, you're not the time, you're given the, the, <clears throat> Some distractions are taken away, but you're also losing stimuli, you know? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And also, I, I don't know whether any of you guys have got kids, but, I, you know, I was homeschooling as well. And my son wouldn't let my partner teach him. So, in fact, and now my partner is away. So I'm on my own with my son homeschooling and trying to write. So writing, actually, weirdly, although I totally agree with you, Jonathan, I had that sort of weird, absolutely everything you guys have said up to this point, but also writing was like the only thing that felt normal where I could, once I was into the book and I could disappear into my other world, I felt like I just got away. It was like escaping. I mean, that's so obvious, isn't it? But it, but it really was like getting away from the kitchen table um, and, and feeling um, like I was actually achieving something rather than kind of treading water, which is what so much of this last year has felt like. Yeah, I've got, I've got two small children and homeschooling has been oh, one experience. What, what a joy, what a joy to be able to do it. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's, it's been tough. It has been tough. I, I, I'm kind of half, when I go, did get a chance to write, it was an escape. And two, I hated it. I hate writing at home, hate it. I much prefer, I like need the noise of noise and confusion of a cafe. There's loads of noise and confusion in this house, but it is not conducive to writing. Um, so I cannot wait till they open the cafes. Honestly, that first day I'm going to be waiting outside. Even if I have the kids have to just kind of wait in a bush shelter for a couple of hours, I'll be in that cafe. Yeah, it just goes to show that like the, the space that you get just doesn't it doesn't necessarily help, does it? You just everyone needs different things from their writing. Also, I find myself second guessing describing things that aren't my house. <laughs> be writing like oh yeah is is them going down the street we're like is that what it was like is that what it was like in the wider world doesn't sound right i you guess you'd be like you finish this you finish a scene you look back and you're like oh that's my kitchen yeah. <laughs> you know you're in a bad way when you're sort of you know you're writing about kind of you know futuristic corporate run dystopias and the least believable thing feels uh, is like describing two characters sitting in a cafe or going out to a restaurant you know just like whoa high fantasy totally crazy stuff and then they sat in a pub really close together yes and just had a beer and it was so good it was so wonderful oh they didn't realize how good it was it's the thing it almost it almost feels like sordid when you're describing like a handshake or something like that it's like oh, i remember those times yeah I know it's that thing where you feel like readers won't be able to suspend their disbelief anymore when you say they kissed or they hugged each other. (laughs) And no one was wearing masks. (laughs) We have uh, reached the end of our time. So I think just to sign off, how about you you guys uh, sign off again and just tell everyone what what your book is and if you remember when your public was or is, and that'll be the end of things. So how about you guys, Susanna? So my book is called This Fragile Earth. Um, My name is Susanna Wise. You can pre-order it now, please do. Um, And my publication date is the 24th of June. Louise? Um, I'm Louise Carey. My book is Inscape. It's already out. It came out on the 21st of January. Um, Please buy it. This is what it looks like. I know it's back to front, but it's a really beautiful edition. And it's, you know, it's good. Read it. No, it looks, it, looks, it looks right on my screen. So we're on to a winner. Ah, fantastic. How about you, Adam? Uh, yeah, my name's Adam Simcox. The book is called The Dying Squad. It is out on the July the 22nd. And it's a high concept speculative fiction police thriller uh, with shades of ri- uh, Rivers of London and Line of Duty. And Johnny. Uh... I'm Jonathan Sims. My book is 13 Stories, and I'm kicking myself because i that's a really good idea, Lou. I should have had a copy of it here uh, so I could show you the, the cover. Uh, it came out uh, in uh, November last year, uh, and I believe uh, paperback should be uh, coming out in October, just in time for Halloween. It's like we planned it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you. It's been really good to talk Cheers, to you guys. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye.
Hello, I'm Joanne Harris. I'm here to tell you about my new book, Honeycomb. Um, I have been writing this for a long time and it's been written in a way that I've never used before. I started to write it as part of a regular Twitter experiment in which I told stories and my Twitter followers either listened or didn't. And as time passed, I started to realise that I wasn't just telling stories. I was telling one long interconnected story with returning characters and and it was going to be part of something else something bigger a novel built entirely unlike any other novel i'd written or come across a novel basically built out of jigsaw pieces each one with its own integrity as a story in itself but also as part of an emerging pattern that would only be visible once all of them had been written and finished and set out. And I called it honeycomb because that was how it seemed to me. It was a honeycomb shape made together of lots of little cells, each one containing a story, each one part of the whole. And every story began like this. There is a story the bees used to tell, which makes it hard to disbelieve. Now I saw this as an old fashioned illustrated book of fantasy for adults from a kind of golden age of fairy stories. I wanted an illustrator and I thought of Charles Vess, who is still one of the great fairy painters of the world. Um, and it helps enormously if a fairy painter actually believes in fairies. And it took me a while to persuade him to come on board with this project, but I think he has done us both proud on this. And it has eventually become this beautiful creation, this, this lovely hardback book in a very particular style with a beautiful cover by Sue Gent and illustrations by Charles Vess. And it's going to be, I think, not only lovely to read, lovely to hold, lovely to own as an object. Um, because I think, you know, the love of books is not just about reading the stories, it's also about possession 
and about the feel of the cover and the smell of the pages and a kind of nostalgia for books of the golden age of storytelling prompted me to write and, and to, to, to create this. And I'm going to read you a little bit from it, um, from one of the early chapters in the book, uh, which deals with the, the birth of my principal character, the rather ambivalently, not quite moral, Lacewing King. Once there was a midwife, renowned for her skill. One winter's night, a man came knocking on her door to ask her to deliver a breech birth child. It was late, it was dark. There was the scent of a storm on the way. But the man, who was a foreigner, promised the midwife rich rewards if she could save his wife and child. And so the midwife went with him riding in his pony trap to a village she did not recognise, and to a cottage, poor but clean, in which a woman in labour lay, fevered and delirious. The midwife ordered the man to leave. He seemed reluctant to do so. When the midwife insisted, he said, I'll leave on one condition. When the baby is born, dab this medicine into his eyes. It's a remedy our people use whenever a child comes into the world and he handed the midwife a tiny vial, no bigger than the ball of her thumb, filled with something that looked to her like honey, dark and clear and just out of the comb. But whatever you do, said the man, do not allow the medicine anywhere near your own eyes. Although it is harmless to our kind, it would be dangerous to you. The midwife agreed and delivered the child, a healthy boy, without difficulty. She took the vial of medicine and anointed his eyes with her fingertip, as the father had instructed, before turning her attention to the mother. The mother's condition was serious and it took all of the midwife's skill to save her life. And when she had finished, the midwife wiped the damp hair from her eyes and a tiny smear of the medicine with which she had anointed the child went into her left eye, making it sting and water. For a moment the midwife was afraid that the medicine had made her blind. But as the mist cleared from her eye, she found that far from having lost her sight, she could see all kinds of new things. Closing her unaffected eye, she looked around at the cottage and the woman whose baby she had birthed. But it was no longer a cottage. Instead, she found herself standing in a fine bedchamber with marble pillars and mosaic floors and a four-poster bed all hung in white silk in which lay the most beautiful woman she'd ever seen. A woman with lidless, honey-dark eyes. The baby too looked different. It was plump and golden-skinned with its mother's troubling eyes. Hello, I'm fantasy author Joe Abercrombie, and this is an excerpt from my forthcoming book, The Wisdom of Crowds. They're here, whispered Grey. Captain Lieb drew his sword. It seemed the right thing to do. I am aware, Corporal, he tried to project an air of confidence. Confidence defines an officer. He remembered his brother telling him so. I can hear them. Judging by the noise, there was a considerable number of them. A considerable number. And steadily approaching. It put Lieb in mind of the crowd's clamour at the contest. Hundreds of voices raised in delighted excitement. Thousands of voices. But there was a definite edge of madness to this sound. A touch of fury, an occasional punctuation of shattering glass, splintering wood. Lieb would have very much liked to run away. He didn't want anyone's blood on his hands, least of all his own. And he wasn't without sympathy for their cause, up to a point. Freedom and justice and so on. 
Who doesn't like that stuff in principle? But he'd sworn an oath to the king. Not to the king directly, of course, but, you know. He'd sworn it even so. He'd been happy to swear it when things were going well and supposed he couldn't just unswear it the moment things turned dicey. What kind of an oath would it be then? His colonel had assured him help was coming from the king's own, then from Westport, then from Starrickland, from ever less likely directions, but no help appeared to have arrived at all. Lieb glanced at his men, spread out across the width of the sparway. What a flimsy little red line they seemed. Perhaps forty bowmen, eighty spearmen, half of his company hadn't come out, somewhat looser in their oaths than he was. He'd always thought there was no more admirable quality than being a man of your word. Loyalty defines an officer, his father had often told him so, but it was starting to look as if a certain elasticity could be a useful thing. They're here, whispered Grey again. I am aware, Corporal, Lieb's mouth turned very dry as the murk from the foundry down the street was thinned out by the breeze. I can see them, more of them indeed, and more. Many looked like ordinary citizens, women and children among them, brandishing chair legs and hammers and knives and spears made from mops. Others looked like professionals, armour and bright weapons glinting as the sun peeped through. Lieb's jaw slowly dropped as he began to appreciate the sheer number of them. Plainly the closed council's increasingly shrill proclamations, curfews, Threats, examples, had not had the desired effect. Quite the reverse. By the fates, someone muttered. Steady, said Lieb, but it came out a squeak that couldn't have steadied anyone. It might have unsteadied those already steady, indeed. It was painfully obvious that his brittle little line had no chance of stopping that boiling tide. No chance at all. When they saw Lieb and his soldiers, they wobbled to a halt, bunching up uncertainly, chants and cheers dying on their lips. There was an intensely awkward silence and an inappropriate memory floated up from the depths of Lieb's mind. The intensely awkward silence after he, drunk, had tried to kiss his cousin Sithrin at that dance and she jerked away in horror so he ended up sort of kissing her ear. This silence was like that one, but a great deal more terrifying. What to do? By the fates, what to do? Let them through, join them, fight them, run and never stop. There were no good ideas. Lieb's lower lip twitched stupidly, but no sound emerged. Even a least bad idea seemed beyond him. Decisiveness defines an officer, but he hadn't been trained for this. They don't train you for the world suddenly coming unravelled. And now a rider pushed through to the front of the throng, a woman with a tangle of damp red hair and a furious sneer. It was as if her rage was an infection, spreading instantly through the crowd. Faces twisted, weapons lifted, screams and cries and taunts burst forth, and suddenly Lieb had no choice at all. Raise bows, he spluttered, almost as if running out of time to think of a better idea. He was left only with this self-evidently terrible one. His men glanced at each other, stirred uncomfortably. Raise bows, roared Corporal Grey, veins bulging from his thick neck. At the same time, he looked at Lee with a vaguely desperate expression. The pilot of a foundering vessel, perhaps, looking to his captain, silently asking if they really did intend to go down with the ship. Perhaps that's why captains do go down with their ships. No better ideas. Shoot! squeaked Lieb, chopping downwards with his sword. He wasn't sure how many actually shot. 
less than half. Afraid to shoot at so many, unwilling to shoot at men who might have been their fathers, brothers, sons, women who might have been their mothers, sisters, daughters. A couple shots high, on purpose or in hurry, there was a scream. Did two or three fall in the front rank of that seething mob? It made not the slightest difference. How could it? The terrifying she-devil at the front stabbed towards Lieb with a clawing finger. Kill those fuckers! And they charged in their hundreds. Lieb was a reasonably brave man, a reasonably honourable man, a reasonable monarchist who took his oath to his king very seriously, but Lieb was not a fool. He turned and ran with his men. It was not a company any more, but a squealing, jostling, whimpering herd of pigs. Someone shoved him and he fell, rolled. He thought it might have been Corporal Grey, damn him. They all were scattering now, tossing their weapons, and he scrambled for an alleyway, knocking a surprised-looking beggar out of his way and nearly falling again. How could one man keep his oath when everyone else was breaking theirs, after all? An army very much relies on unity of purpose. Run for the Agriont. That was all he could think of. He plunged through the crooked back streets, his neck prickling with fear, his breath soaring at his chest. Damn weak lungs, he'd been cursed with them all his life. Can you name a Lord Marshal with weak lungs? His brother used to ask. Lungs define an officer! Adua's foul vapours hardly helped. He sagged into a doorway, trying to suppress his cough. he dropped his sword somewhere. Or had he thrown it away? Bloody hell! He stared down at his officer's jacket, bright red. How could it be redder? The whole purpose was to make him stand out, like a bullseye on a target. He stumbled from the doorway, struggling with the brass buttons, and almost straight into a group of heavy-set men. Workers, maybe, from one of the foundries in the neighbourhood. But there was a wildness in their eyes, whites showing stark in their grease-smeared faces. They stared at him, and he at them. Now, listen, he said, raising one weak hand. I was just doing my... They were not interested. Not in his duty, or his oath, or his sympathy for their cause, or his reasonable monarchism. It was not a day for the reasonable, let alone for whatever defines an officer. One of them put his head down and charged. Lieb managed to throw one punch as he came, a harmless one, which missed the mark and bounced off the man's forehead. His brother had once told him how to punch, but he hadn't really been listening. He wished he'd listened now, but then his brother hadn't really known anything about punching either. The man caught Lieb in the side with his shoulder, knocked his wind out, lifted him bodily and brought him down on the wet cobbles with a stunning crash. Then they were all on him, kicking, swearing, slavering madmen, furious animals. Lieb curled up as best he could, whimpering at each blow, saying that something hit him so hard in the back he was sick. To his horror, he saw one of them take out a knife. And you can find out what happens when the book is published in September. So this is a little piece from The Sunken Land Begins to Rise Again, which won the 2020 Goldsmiths Prize. At that time of year, you could almost hear the water rising under everything. It filled the ancient drains and subcellars. It filled the cap wells and the forgotten sewerage culverts, the late 18th century mining galleries and ghosts abandoned beneath the early Victorian townhouses, the half-closed shafts that opened suddenly in people's gardens, proving upon examination to be choked with lumps of worthless penny stone like fossilised children's heads. Stealthily but determinedly forcing its way as it did winter after winter between the layered mazes of the old workings. Nothing down there could really be said to flow. Nevertheless, the groundwater rose and fell, it dripped and seeped. It percolated through the fractured beds beneath the coppices through the demented, unpredictable, immeasurably fortunate geology. 
fuel for the industrial light and magic that had once changed the world. The iron money, the engine money, the steam and tontine money, the raw underground money hidden in unconformable strata, secret seams and voids in jumbled shales, fire, clays, tar, coal measures and thinly bedded limestone. To Exitus seeps and springs above the heritage museums and leisure trails and decommissioned railways, while associated subsidence gnawed quietly away at the superficial architecture of the gorge, peeling the narrow lanes slowly off its wooded slopes. The gorge channeled the river, yet was in itself only a sponge storing vast reservoirs drop by drop in the decaying matrix of history. In town, meanwhile, the newer pavements displayed a tendency to lift and ripple, while at 92 High Street, the three-room basement, with its brick barrel vaulting and late 19th century kitchen range, began to weep and smell. All through the house, Victoria's newly fashionable chalk paints and distempers yellowed overnight with damp. She sat listening to the rain, the dogs barking next door, the weird buzz of the kitchen fluorescent fitment. There was always a lot of wet coughing outside the front window. Old men, exhausted and complaining as they exchanged the news, turned out to be young men when she looked. Uneasily at first, she returned to the fields behind the town and a few days later found herself beside the pool where she had last seen her friend Pearl, the waitress. It seemed more extensive. The wind ruffled its surface, the rain dimpled it. She stared at the tuft of rushes in the centre. Nothing. The petals of the submerged flowers looked a little duller. Some sort of mist or viper was hanging over the woods. Victoria huddled beneath the pylon as if it might provide shelter, struggled with the impulse to take off her shoes and wade into the water. She was trying and failing to remember, to admit to, what had happened here. But after all, what was there to remember? Things being what they are, people don't walk into a pond as if they are descending the tube station steps on a slow Wednesday afternoon at Oxford Circus. They don't vanish that way when you're watching. Pearl had understood quite well that she was being watched. And not so much by Victoria, who with her pretty latte coloured car and London stylings had always been less than a player, as by the owner of the voice among the waiting trees. All along she had been aware of that half-hidden gaze. She had sought its approval, felt and welcomed the weight of it. She had come to the pool that morning to be seen. Hello, this is Johnny Sims, reading from my novel 13 Stories. On reflection, it shouldn't have surprised Yannick just how confusing the pipes in Banyan Court really were. What else had he been expecting? Though he had to take a moment to stare in stunned silence when he got through a piece of wall only to be confronted by a huge cast-iron drainage pipe. The thing must have been at least 150 years old, and put Yannick in mind of a massive, varicose vein, swollen with age and neglect. Its existence might have made some sense, given the age of the original building, except for the fact that this was on the 11th floor, several stories above where the old factory had stopped. If they'd used the old piping up here, they'd have had to specifically remove it, and reinstall it several floors up, which would have been a pointlessly bad idea. 
Not that the old cast iron pipes wouldn't still work with proper upkeep, but modern plumbing was a hell of a lot more reliable and generally much easier to install. This was the most extreme example, but he'd been finding similar instances all day. There was modern pipework there as well, since there's no way the original building had enough to service all of Banyan Court. But the old iron tubes seemed to be the backbone of the system, the arteries and intestines into which it all connected. If he had to guess, Yannick would even go so far as to say that there was more new pipework in the cramped and unpleasant rear of the building, with most of the older parts in the tasteful front section. It had been a long time since he had worked construction, but he could think of no conceivable reason to do this. Someone, somewhere, had specifically demanded it be done like this, and, whoever they were, they must have been too rich and too important for anybody to tell them no. He had to go deeper. If he was going to make a diagnosis, he needed to see the worst of the symptoms. And these pipes were the key. He was sure of it. So Yannick spent a few hours finding the largest concentration of them, and went to work. It didn't take, it didn't take much work to unearth a short access pipe. Placing down the section of plaster he had cut away, he began to remove its covering. It started smoothly, but after a few turns, the cap stopped abruptly, apparently stuck fast. Yannick paused, running through all the possibilities of exactly what might be keeping it from opening. It was old, certainly, but it didn't look like it was rusted shut. He turned away for a moment, rifling through his toolkit for something to force it over. He turned away for a moment, rifling through his toolkit for something to force it open, when a small noise froze him in place. He knew the sound, of course, of the access cover slowly rotating, unscrewing behind him. He was alone with the pipes, hadn't seen another living soul for over an hour, and if it was being opened, then it was being opened from the inside. Yannick had to turn around. He had to. What was the point of all this if he couldn't bring himself to actually look at what he had found? But in that moment, there was nothing on earth he wanted to do less than to see what was going to come out of that pipe. The noise stopped, and for a moment, Yannick almost felt relief. Before there was the tap, tap, tapping of something small and hard on the inside of the cast iron. It was calling to him. It wanted him to look. He turned around to face the pipes just as the cap came off completely, falling to the floor with a clatter. There was a moment of quiet, as though pausing for effect. And then the stillness was broken by a gush of foul-smelling liquid spurting out of the pipe at him. Yannick took an involuntary step back, his eyes still focused on the dark opening. There it was, white and slimy against the dark metal, a finger. The bone shone through where the flesh had rotted away, pale and cold, while what was left had swollen into bloated and waxy lumps. Yannick waited. Whatever this was, it wasn't finished. He was sure of that. The finger stretched out of the hole, which was far too narrow to permit anything wider than the the finger stretched out of the hole, which was far too narrow to allow anything wider than the decaying hand that followed it. It tapped again, this time on the outside of the pipe, the sound of wet bone on rusted iron, clearly calling for his attention. He almost laughed at the thought that he might be doing anything other than staring at the rhythmic movements of this insistent corpse's hand. It stretched towards him, and then slowly, purposefully, crooked its thin finger, gesturing him closer. One step at a time, Yannick approached, disgusted and intrigued by this strange invitation. 
He wanted to keep his distance, his mind fixating on the thought of an arm suddenly shooting out of the pipe and grabbing him by the throat, clammy, rotten fingers digging into his windpipe. But he continued his approach, until at last he was in front of it. He took a moment, readying himself before bending down, his eyes now level with the hole, staring directly into the darkness of the pipe, visible around the thin wrist. He mechanically reached for his torch. The hand withdrew just as he clicked the button, sending the powerful beam of the maglite directly into the opening. What he saw inside took a few moments to fully register. His eyes kept fixating on tiny details, like they were trying their best not to comprehend the complete image. More white bones and bloated flesh, almost enough to make a full body, but so crushed and pressed together that it was impossible to be sure. The pipe was less than eight inches across, and with only a twisted cross-section visible, he couldn't make any anatomical sense of the compacted mess. He could see something there that might have been a foot. Squashed next to it was what might once have been a ribcage all covered with a torn and stained grey jumpsuit, one Yannick almost thought he recognised. At the centre of the mass, his torchlight fell upon a single blue eye. It blinked once, not cloudy and dead, but shining, alert and focused. It fixed on him, and a few things next to it that might have been teeth shifted their position. Was it trying to smile. The whole thing shifted, bone and skin and fabric rippling around the crushed corpse as it moved, revealing more of itself to Yannick's torchlight. A second later, and he could just about assemble the image into almost a face, all topped with the remains of a broken, off-white hard hat. Between that and the jumpsuit, Yannick had a sudden, horrible impression of what he was looking at, and it was only the knowledge and it was only the knowledge that his own eyes were a deep brown that managed to... between that and the jumpsuit yannick had a sudden horrible impression of what he was looking at and it was only the knowledge that his own eyes were a deep brown that managed to shake off the thought that he was somehow staring at his own mangled corpse as it continued to move, he saw that knotted and twisted all around it was a broken safety harness, with torn polyester straps and shattered metal links all caught in each other, giving an impression halfway between an ensnared prisoner and a grotesque piece of gift wrapping. Then all at once it started to slide backwards, disappearing silently back down the pipe like it was being sucked through a pneumatic tube. It took no more than a couple of seconds for it to be out of reach of Yannick's light, leaving only a faint, bloody residue on the iron interior. He was alone once again. He went to the opposite wall and leaned heavily against it, his body overcome with a sudden feeling of intense cold. He slid down until he sat on the floor next to his tool kit, and he didn't even bother to check the ceiling for smoke alarms, before he raised a cigarette to his lips with shaking hands. He wanted to think, to consider what he had just seen, but his mind was entirely blank. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us for this event for Galantz Fest at Home. This is the 60th anniversary of Galantz as a science fiction and fantasy publisher this year. Um, and I wish we could be celebrating it in person, but we can't at the moment, we all know why. And so we are doing a series of these events um, all day. And this is the panel on fantasy. I'm joined by four of Galantz's um, uh, most fantastical authors. I should, sorry, uh, hi, I'm Marcus Gibbs. I'm the publishing director of Galantz and I should probably have led with that, but there you go. You're not here to see me. <laughs> Um, let me introduce our authors in the order they are on my screen. So starting with Ed Cox. Ed is the author of The Relic Guild, Song of the Sycamore, oh, yeah. and the forthcoming The Would-Be Queen. Um, Ed, would you like to say one line about The Would-Be Queen? 
Monsters, Magic and Mayhem. Brilliant. Um, next we have Joanne Harris. Joanne Harris has written a number of books for Galan. She's written the Loki books, which are Norse-inspired. Uh, she's written a series of fairy tales. Uh, the forthcoming book from Galantz is called Honeycomb. That's out this summer and is a collection beautifully illustrated by Charles Vess of uh, Joanne's... Well, how would you describe them, Joanne? It's a novel built out of stories. Um, and all, and all, they all start with, there is a thing the bees used to say. Yes, that's right. They, they are based on my Twitter stories that always start with the phrase, there is a story the bees used to tell, which makes it hard to disbelieve. And Joanne is, of course, also the author of uh, some non-Galance novels, most recently The Strawberry Thief, which was a sequel to Chocolat. Uh, going around the houses, Nalini Singh is joining us from New Zealand. This is the one of the, the benefits of uh, doing these virtually. It means we can get authors along who we might not be able to attempt to a uh, half-hour panel session in foils on the other side of the world. But, you know, <laughs> it's great to see Nalini. Nalini is the author of literally dozens of best-selling titles, the Side Changing series. Um, and has recently branched out into writing sort of more straight crime, I would say, quiet in her bones. Yeah, it's, yeah, straight crime. Yeah. Um, and I want to touch a bit later on, on on the fact that all of these authors have sort of worked across genres. But first, let me introduce Ben Aronovich, who is leaning out of shot. Um, ben is the author of the best-selling Rivers of London series, which um, are marking their 10th anniversary this year as well. Um, the most recent is the novella What Abigail Did That Summer. Ben, would you like to... Summarize that in a line. <laughs> I mean, apart from what it's about, what Abigail did that summer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, that's what it says on the tin, basically. No, it's uh, it's I, it's my I know, uh, foxes, magic houses, hamster stuff. All of which you can see on the very very professional background you see there behind Ben. I love it. Ah, yes. Well, is that on my horrible bedroom? So there you go. That was your choice. So this is a panel about fantasy, and I wanted to start, I'm going to have to read this off my screen, so I, I came across, on actually, randomly on Twitter a couple of days ago, this lovely quote from Terry Pratchett, which I don't think I had read before, you may have done. Fantasy is without a shadow of a doubt the early literature, the spring from which all other literature has flown. Up until a few hundred years ago, no one would have disagreed with this, because most stories were, in some sense, fantasy. Um, and he goes on to say Pilgrim's Progress, <clears throat> Epic of Gilgamesh, the National Literature of Finland, Beowulf in England, the Bhagavad Gita. The National Literature, the one that underpins everything else, is by the standards we apply now, works of fantasy. And I wondered whether that resonated with any of you, whether you, you, you felt, that this, I should say this was in response to a, um, a rather sniffy journalist asking him why he wrote fantasy when he could quite clearly be such a good writer if he wrote something else. There he is, you can imagine, did not take that well. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a, it's a lovely quote. Um, there's something similar that Gene Wolfe said um, quite a long time ago in regards to Neil Gaiman, I think. Um, and it was something along the lines of all books are fantasy, but some are more honest about it. And I've always liked that. Um, so I think that, you know, Joanne has spoken a lot about uh, mythology and, uh, and how they help us form a relationship with the world. And I think fantasy is the beginning of storytelling. It sure is, isn't it? Or am I talking... <laughs> Sorry, I've gone quiet and nobody jumped in. <laughs> um, I mean, I, th I think that that's true. And it, it, certainly, Joanne, you, you, you've written books which have been inspired by, by mythology. Um, and then I, a lot of the um, fantastical elements in yours come from folklore. <coughs> Excuse me. Come from folklore and myth. <coughs> Is there something in those stories that we still find universal? I think don't look at it from this point of view. From my point of view, there are a lot of um, poor substandard literary authors out there who should have just followed their first instincts and written fantasy and were forced into this kind of straitjacket of literary respectability by um, a, an ill-guided sort of writing course or going to Oxbridge or something like that. And if they had followed their instincts in the first place, we'd be writing really good three three you know three volume epic fantasy novels where instead writing very boring stories about people having relationships in in Essex or somewhere. Hey uh, I live in Essex careful right. <laughs> uh, Watford yeah. and, um or you know Buckinghamshire probably actually Buckinghamshire is more preferred. And I, I think 
Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, everyone wants to write fantasy. It's just some of them are led astray by um, by other, you know, by society's pressure on you not to write fantasy. That's that's my take on the whole fantasy versus literary fiction. Plus, I'm I'm on record as saying that literary fiction is essentially a marketing term and uh, operates on the same principle as gym memberships in that they know perfectly well that about 90% of the people who buy their books are not going to read them. Uh, they're going to have every intention of reading them. They're going to see the Booker Prize, they're going to get the Booker Prize winner, and they're going to, but most of the time they don't actually read them. So I, I think uh, I think it's all moot whether, if, if, you know, Terry Pratchett obviously wanted to be read by people. And so that's why he wrote the books he wrote. Very cynical, Ben. Nalini, when you when you were sort of starting out, were you always planning to include the supernatural elements in your work, or, or was that something that you you toyed with other books first? Uh, no, it it just came out with the actually the very first stories I read, and um, I was going to say I was a big daydreamer as a kid, and I think that's sort of the going back to the fantasy roots, you know, those sort of making up things to amuse myself when I had to go to boring adult things. And um, so that's where it began. But um, yeah, uh, because I, I read huge amount of fantasy and science fiction as a child. And I think, especially, I don't know if everyone agrees, but I think when you first start out writing, the things we read are the ones that we sort of inspire us. And that's what we try to emulate almost and that's kind of what started coming out at first when I wrote so yeah it's always been one of my very first loves in terms of um, reading and writing yeah. I, I want to come back Nalini later on to um, your, your switch then into, into the, the more straight crime but, but Joanne obviously there are magical realism elements to almost everything I think you've written probably but did you find moving from what might be considered straight literature into the more fantastical problematic or enjoyable or had you always wanted to do it well I don't understand why people use these terms I never use them I've never really thought about whether my stuff was literary or magical realism or fantasy I just write it because I think you know that I think the reading world is divided between people who understand that books are made up therefore everything is fantasy unless it's you know, memoir or something and the people who 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 don't and so I mean to me all fantasy is real on some level because it's all filtered through metaphor and so the myths and the fairy tales and the stories that I was brought up with which were very clearly fantasy because they were all about kind of magic and wolves and and dragons and monsters they were supposed to mean something I understood this from being a child they were supposed to to give us the the armory mentally to deal with real life monsters and situations of potential heroism that, that we encounter on a day to day basis. They weren't there to tell us that werewolves are real or that witches exist or whatever, but they were something else. And so to me, fantasy has always been the, the, the secret language of the human subconscious. And when you look at things like Beowulf or the child ballads or Grimm's fairy tales, it, it's very clear that every one of them is a kind of lesson in how to approach some some kind of life challenge how to you know how to face your monsters mm -hmm. how to be the hero of your own story how to let love save you all of these things are absolutely rooted in reality and and i'm always very puzzled when people talk about fantasy as if it doesn't have any relation to the human experience because none of these things would have survived if they hadn't been relevant to the human experience and the fact that they're still here and we're still writing about them and talking about them proves that they still do. I, I always find it interesting that so much of children's literature, and by that I mean right down to picture books, is overtly fantastical and that's just accepted by everybody because people understand that most kids don't want to read a searing indictment of the modern welfare state when they're three. They want to read about tigers, but do they want to read about anthropomorphic animals because that's what we tell them that they're going to read I don't know but I'm never quite sure where the line is where suddenly you're meant to stop expecting a book to be fun and exciting and yes fantastical and become more realistic um, but it's certainly not before you're a teenager I suppose there are your Jacqueline Wilsons and people like that who are writing about the lived experience but but even those I think as you say everything is fun is fantasy everything is made up 
think that it's interesting you mentioned children's books there because um, <clears throat> when my daughter was young, uh, we, we decided that we wasn't going to push a certain type of book on her. We was going to try and guide her, but let her decide what she wanted to read. Um, and she started gravitating towards the books where you do, as Joanne says, become the hero of your own story. And it shows you, it shows your relationship with that in the world through fantastical means. Um, you know, my daughter was uh, um, afraid, afraid of the dark when she was younger. And we found a book by Lemony Snicket called The Dark. I don't know if anybody's found this book, but it's about a boy called Laszlo. Who, kind of, who is afraid of the dark, but the dark is a sort of supernatural presence in the story. And he goes looking into it and he goes searching into the unknown and finds that the dark shows him where a light bulb is and that kind of thing, where he can scroll in and get some light. And, and she loved that story. And it was the first story that she actually read back to me. Um, and so she naturally gravitated towards, I don't know, finding her relationship with the world, I guess, and with the unknown, and, you know, and how she related to, to, to these stories. But do you think, and this is sort of an open question for anyone, really, though, none of you write what some people would call fantasy, as in the, the Tolkien-esque mode. You all write variations. you all of you really are sort of writing, I know this is a published term, Joanne, I know you won't like it, but you're all sort of writing cross genre, um, whether it's uh, Ben doing sort of police procedural, but with a fantastical twist, Nalini romance, Ed, Ed's books, you know, you could call them horror in places. There's a lot of body horror in them and, and Joanne's mythological or folklorish. Um, do you think that when we talk about as it were, the epic fantasy, the Tolkien-esque fantasy, there is still room there for that to work as metaphor, to work as um, something else? Or is it just people like reading about sword fights and magic? I would totally write an epic fantasy tomorrow if I had time. But three books, all, you know, three 120 to 150,000 word books, you know, with my speed, not going to happen. But I've got one. I have an epic fantasy in my head ready to go i have an epic fantasy i have a low magic domestic fantasy i have a reworking of the princess in the tower story i have all these stories none of which i'll probably ever get to write because i just would love to write them but i don't have the schedule time for it you know and and i have not yet found a way of of, of doing the patterson thing of getting other people to write my books for me although as soon as i work that out you can expect a spread of epic fantasy <laughs> to land on your desk so do, do you all have ideas that you'd love to get to, but just can't find the time, whether that's in a different genre or a different style? I, I, often, yeah. find, <laughs> I often find that, stored, that the ideas get stored up and they end up not being ideas of their own, but part of collective. So they end up all going in, in, into one book. I find that happens to me a lot. Yeah, me too. That's I keep, uh, oh, sorry. No, I think to, to me, I, I write short stories to get the um, to get the breadth of the things that I want to do, so that you know it doesn't it doesn't take two years to write whatever kind of weird thing that I've got in my head. So I really enjoy the process of moving from writing, you know, western to a horror story to a fairy story um, within a few days, rather than having to to commit so much mental time and energy into just doing one thing. And, and I, want, I want to hear Elise answer, but just one quick one for Joanna. Do you write those just for pleasure or do you wait to be commissioned or do you have a market for them or are they just to exist? I just write them and then I find where they belong, if they belong somewhere at all. And, and sometimes they, they don't. Short stories don't get commissioned terribly often as far as, as I'm concerned, really. And when they are, they're not always the story I want to write. And so I don't tend to, to say yes to them a lot of the time. Hmm. But going back to epic fantasy for a minute, I think it's it's interesting that the snobbery that exists around epic fantasy, as if the large story told in a particular way is somehow better than the small story told in a new and different and quirky way. And it's, it's not knocking epic fantasy, which is great, but there is nothing inherently better um, in somebody like Tolkien writing these enormous worlds and this kind of rather self-aware, antiquated prose, and somebody writing about, you know, something much smaller and much closer to home. 
Mm. Yeah. Uh, academically speaking, I found that in academic circles, there's almost this feeling that epic fantasy um, or traditional fantasy started and ended with the Lord of the Rings trilogy. You know, and yeah. what came after that isn't as easy to accept for some reason. I'm not, I've never really worked out why. It's, I don't know. I think there's, you know, especially in the educational system, um, there's a need to pigeonhole. And I, okay, epic fantasy is Lord of the Rings. We've got that covered. Let's move on to more important things. I, you know, that's just a, a feeling that I've got. Over. I, I think they would ignore Lord of the Rings if it wasn't the most <laughs> special book ever written. But yeah. exceptions. I think they would love to ignore Lord of the Rings. I think they would love to sweep the entire genre under the bed and never talk about it and never teach it and never have anything to do with it whatsoever. And it's only because actually it's hugely popular and people buy it and it actually supports the publishing industry um that you know and and uh, they have to they have to at least confront it if only to put it down this this i know this is me sounding much more cynical than i really am because i don't really think about it but that's that's generally it the, it's because i've been dealing with television people recently and that always makes me cynical um can we go back to nalini i'm sorry sorry to, we skipped on there nalini but can we talk about you, you oh, were about you're about to tell us about about the ideas that you have that don't make it into books and uh, do you find that because you write you have such long running series that you have ideas that you just couldn't fit into that even if you wanted to. And is that where something like Quiet and Her Bones comes from? Yes. <laughs> I was gonna say I do a little bit like Joanne, which is I just write something. So I might write just a couple of pages on an idea and I literally have a file of ideas where I've written whatever the scene, sometimes it's just a scene that's come to me that doesn't fit in anything else I've written. Um, and just getting it out there, let's, I call them like the shiny squirrels in my brain, you know, it puts all the squirrels in a, in a box and then I can, I can keep thinking on the project I'm supposed to be working on, but because I've written it out, it's still there in the subconscious, you know, working away at it. And at some point, some of them turn into books and at other points, you know, they do turn into short stories or novellas or something like that. Yeah. And, and do you find the process of um, <clears throat> writing in, in obviously much loved series um, sometime, sometimes, sometimes, um, I'm trying to think about the best way to put this, sometimes um, restricts what you can do with some of your ideas, of, especially of fantasy? Um, like there are, I'm, no. I mean, I, I've worked out a better way to put it. You have rules in place. Most fantasies have rules and Ben has rules in the Rivers of London. Mm. Do you find that something you sometimes butt against or do you find that, that having that, that structure helps you write? No, I think it's good because I think rules, continuity is what gives tension to a story because as soon as um, a writer or in television or anywhere, if they break the rule of continuity, that all the tension is gone because every time they've set up this, um, for example, say a quest, right? And there's this thing in between that they, there's no easy way out. And then suddenly there's an easy way out. And then for any future time you set up that kind of a problem, the reader or the viewer is not going to believe it because you've broken that, that rule. Mm -hmm. So I think um, holding on to those rules of the world is really what makes really great books. Because I know for me, it's made me think, like really sit down and think, how can I fix this problem that I've set up five books ago and backed myself into a corner, and now I have to figure out a way to get out. Um, and so, yeah, no, I don't feel constrained at all. I actually really enjoy working in a world that's built, has its own structure, has its own rules, and um, yeah, and, and how to tell really interesting stories within that world. It's funny, I think one of the things that people do like about fantasy is that sense of you can write down the rules in a sort of slightly reductive Dungeons and Dragons way. But and I'm certainly not saying for all fantasy and certainly not for your works, but it's definitely a thing that people like. They like to know this is the map. This is the rules of the world. And now I understand it perhaps in a way that we can never understand the real world around us. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think so. I think I think some people, yeah, for some people that's the appeal, but 
I don't think it's the appeal. I think for some people that's an appeal. And for some, in some ways, it's fun writing within that kind of restriction, the same way writing within a haiku or a sonnet is, is fun. But it's not the appeal of fantasy is not that there are rules that are like in some way that you know everyone knows the rules of the real world they just don't like them <laughs> yeah and I, and I think it's, you know i think readers need to understand enough about the world to the point where they can relate to it where they understand it um you know I, i've never been i've never been consciously aware of writing rules on magic for example um, for, for me, it's always been more a case of limitation. Um, you know, magic is this, for me, so far in the stories that I've read, I'm not saying this isn't going to change, but, you know, and I might end up with a and d esque magic system, but um, magic for me is, is more a wild, untamable force. It's, it's an extra element. Um, and its limitation comes from the creativity of the character using it. And I've always been interested in how magic can be used as a fuel. Um, I kind of try to think of it as being the moment where magic came along with the moment where we split the atom or something like that. So I've always been interested in how it's used as a fuel for technology, for example, and how people and magic will evolve side by side. And that's something that I was doing with the, in the Relic Yield series and more so in the Song of the Sycamore. Um, so with rules, I, I, it's really difficult because I've been asked this question recently about world building. And I said, I, I'm not really aware of world building starting or stopping. I can only tell you when it feels right, when the world feels right for the story I'm telling and the characters who are in it and any barriers that are set up in, um, in, in that world, the story and the characters start following it naturally. You know? So it's, it's all going on. I'm probably just not intellectual enough to vocalize it. No. And does that, uh, Joanne, I'm thinking specifically of the Loki books, um, where obviously you're drawing on an established mythology, but an established mythology which is very fluid and which there are lots of moving parts to and which is contradictory. And um, it, does that mean that you can pick the bits you want to write about and ignore the ones you don't? Or do you, f um, you feel that there is, there is a, a firm narrative in there that you have to stick to? How, how does it work when you're, when you're drawing on those myths so explicitly? I think there are so many narratives that it means that you don't have to stick to one or indeed any of them. I think, you know, the fact that these these myths still exist and are still being used means that there's obviously something there that we want to respond to. But what I haven't wanted to do is to go back to another retelling of them. So you've got you've got Snorri, who, who basically wrote them down after the oral tradition had started to die out and and he wrote in a very particular sort of heroic style that some people think Norse myths should still have. I, I don't think they should at all. I've taken the opposite point of view. And I thought, you know, these, these, these myths that were written in this rather pompous style were taken from the oral tradition in the first place and they were rephrased and they were reshaped and they were given a different, a different angle by this, this Christian chronicler. So I thought, you know, I'm going to take them back to what they obviously were when people were not just sort of declaiming in verse and um, and make them much more of the people. And so I've deliberately included slang and, and ridiculous uh, um, elements which would not have existed, um, you know, a couple of thousand years ago. But it doesn't matter because actually that's the, those things are not the rules that are important. The, 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 to me, it's the it's the human element that's interesting. And the relationship element, and you know, I've, I've riffed on the concept of the nine worlds and and the structure of Asgard without being one of those authors that wants to have a lot of maps and and a lot of uh, fantasy world building. I think some people like that, and sometimes it's great, but I've always tried to avoid that in in my writing. So I, the the, the We've sort of touched on it already, but the, the, the impact of, of folklore and myth, obviously, Ben, I want to come to you in a second because it, it's threaded through your books, but Nalini, do you find that, um, and I, I'm afraid I don't know anything like as much as I should about New Zealand folklore, do you find that, that there is um, a, a fresh well of uh, inspiration there? I think, I think it's there, but I'm also very aware of the stories 
I should be telling and the stories that I should be championing from others instead. And so I think particularly when you're talking about an indigenous culture, it's, um, you know, it's, I think it's better if you can find those storytellers who really have a deep connection to the story and, um, you know, talk about their stories instead. Whereas me, I'm more likely to draw from like, you know, Indian mythology, because obviously that's the culture that I've grown in and that I feel really connected to. So, you know, I think there are going to be some really, really interesting stories coming out of New Zealand because I can see the younger writers, you know, coming up and um, starting to sort of mine those stories. Um, but yeah, for me, I feel like I would rather, you know, try and lift them up than dip into that myself. Yeah. Yes, and sorry, forgive me, I, I worded that badly. I wasn't implying that, that you know, we should be wholesale lifting other cultures for, for our books. I, I, I was thinking more, more of... Um, I, the point I was trying to touch on was both you and Ben write in what is normally the real world with your series, but obviously with the supernatural elements coming in. And I was just wondering where, where those are drawn from. Obviously, some of them are... are sort of endemic in our culture, whether it's vampires or werewolves, and others can be more specific to a country or a location. And I'm thinking, you know, a lot of the um, uh, sort of the old English folklore that Ben uses, and I was wondering about that. But I, I yeah, I, I worded that badly and I apologize. Um, no, that's all right. I can actually answer. <laughs> I can answer the question. In my case, it's, um, it's not so much uh, mythology and folklore. It's more um, questions about us as humans. And so the, my site changing series asked the question, you know, what if we did use every um, part of our brain all of the time, you know, instead of using parts as we need them? And what if that turned us into telepaths and telekinetics? And what if that drove us insane? You know, what would we do to survive? So it's really just taking humans and then pushing it to the next level. And with the Guild Hunter series, one of the central questions is, if we did live 10,000 years, would we be in any way human at all? Or would we be inhuman? So for me, um, those are the base questions that tend to drive my stories, I realized. It's about the people. And that, that sort of touches back on Ed's point about using power and what we would use that for if, if we had a new source or a new form of power, a different form of power. Yeah, for sure. I agree with that. Um, okay, so but Ben, Ben, let's um, touch briefly on on the research you do into your folklores and your um, mythologies and the supernatural characters you bring into the books. Uh, research is not really the right word. I just I kind of like grab stuff and stick it in. I I, I always think of my writing technique as the the gumbo school of of, of novelizing in that you get a big pot and you just keep chopping vegetables and bits of fish and things and, and sort of adding sauces until it tastes good, basically, or, or you throw it out. One of the two things happens. So far, I've never had to throw anything out. Um, I do do a lot of research, mainly because uh, there's just a lot of history where I am. I mean, you know, it's uh, London is an old city and so therefore you have a lot of, even the bits you don't think have a lot of history turn out to have a lot of history. I was fascinated to find that there were like a series of battles in Brentford, which is like not a place you associate with grand <laughs> historical events and, and, and places like that. So, you know, and down the Thames, there's all these kind of battle sites because the Thames, of course, was a, a, a major river crossing. And so there's battles all through the Middle Ages and before there were battles along the Thames at various river crossings. And, and so you start looking into that and you just get ideas and the ideas come and then you just basically, you know, steal them and use them for your sport. Uh, basically. Um, I also like the what if aspect, like what if Father Thames was real? And yeah. what if he had vacated, you know, like London during the Great Stink, which is a real thing, and he had gone up and he had gone, what if you, what, if he, what would he be like? Where did he come from? When did he become like Father Thames? When was that instituted? And, you know, I went, oh, okay, it was the Romans, because I thought that was probably the first bridge across the Thames uh, at that point. But, you know, I could have gone anywhere with that, but that's where I went. And, you know, what if, 
what if magic is real? And and then how do we make it so that people don't know it exists? Because that would be really annoying and you'd have to write an alternative universe story, which I didn't want to do. So, <laughs> you know, but I could have done, I could have gone down the like everyone knows about magic and it could have been, you know, like there could have been an institutional in magic, magical society and everything. That was one of the things I looked at and other people have done that. And that would have been really interesting. It's like, there's all taking off points and then you just go where the kind of way where you think you should go and and that's the beauty of being a writer is is like as opposed to like a historian where you actually have to kind of try and stick to the facts with a writer if you suddenly decide that you know mama thames the, the goddess of the river thames is actually from nigeria that's fine you can do that no one can stop you um, we're coming up to the end of our time so i just wanted very very quickly to ask you all to recommend a book to our viewers doesn't have to be fantasy, doesn't have to be Galantz, doesn't have to be, it can even be one of your own if you like, but if we could just, one thing that you think someone would enjoy reading from this panel, um, if we start with Nalini. Okay, so one of my finds in quarantine, <laughs> in lockdown, was actually uh, P. Jelly Clark. He is a uh, fantasy writer um, from the US and he writes in um, like an alternate history Cairo in the 1920s and um, they're like murder mysteries set in this fantastical world and it's they're incredible I love them um, so far he's just had I think four novellas mm -hmm. published um, with his first full-length book coming out this year so I'm excited for that and I I think he's just he's a brilliant writer and he builds worlds in such a small format you know in the novella format he had me sucked in from the first time I, I turned the page in that book and I was like, well, I must read everything this person has ever written, which oh, I did. Quite the um, recommendation. So now it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So can you say the name again for us, please, and the title of one of the books? Uh, okay, so P. Jelly Clark. So it's P, the initial, and then D-J-E-L-I, and then Clark. And the first book in that seri series is A Dead Gin in Cairo. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Ben? I'm going to second that one because they are very good books and I enjoyed them immensely. But well, I'm going, I've got, I've got this handy, The Gilded Ones by Namina oh, Porter, which is, uh, which I think is, you know, uh, apropos of what we're discussing, which is a big, nice, big epic fantasy uh, with West African overtones, which is like almost got my name written on it, really, um, in terms of like, you will buy this book and enjoy it. So, and also <laughs> I'm doing a panel with them soon, so that works kind of handy. <laughs> Fantastic. Joanne? Um, mine is a book by Bridget Collins called The Binding, and it's a very interesting book set in a sort of alternative historical world. It's, it's a gay romance where book binding is, it's clearly a sort of magical metaphor for being, in, being locked in the closet. People who have upsetting or um, otherwise controversial or bad things happen to them, have them bound into books by a special book binder and the book then takes their memory away and it's then locked away and there's a whole underground organisation where these books and these memories are sold on the black market. Wow. And it's just a wonderful scenario. Um, it doesn't, yeah, it, com it was completely startling and new to me. I loved it. The binding and that was by? Bridget Collins. Thank you very much. Ed? Well, I'm going to suck up to Galantz here a little bit. I just got a, an advanced copy of um, Artifact Space by Miles Cameron, who usually writes uh, historical fiction as Christian Cameron and the more traditional -ish fantasy um, as Miles Cameron for Galantz. Um, and he's written a space opera which I, I can't wait, you know, the cover is absolutely gorgeous. The spaceship looks like a sword. So, you know, um, Miles is a swordsmith. So I'm really looking forward to, to reading that one. Um, and I've, I've, read, I've read some of it, I've read the opening and it, it's promising to be very, very good. So that's Miles Cameron, Artifact Space. And also I'm reading a zombie story at the moment, which is something I didn't expect to read given the current situation in the world. Um, but it's by Gavin G. Smith, and it's called Spec Ops Z. Um, and it's kind of, it's set in the 80s. 
it's not quite like any zombie story I've ever read before, and it's bonkers and utterly brilliant. Um, you have uh, Russian special forces in the 80s before Glasnost happened, and you know, um, and they come to America on what they think is a kind of training exercise, but what they actually do is go to this place where a secret chemical weapon is being stored and unwittingly um, activate this chemical weapon and it spreads out in New York and the world just kind of falls apart from there. But although the Russian soldiers, the special ops soldiers, um, they get infected with the virus, they retain their humanity. And it's a kind of study into the disintegration of the world while being just unlike any other zombie story I've ever read before. It's kind of military horror sci-fi with a heart, and it's absolutely brilliant. I'm coming to the end of that now. So, yeah, Spec Ops said by Gavin G. Smith. Lovely. Well, thank you all for joining us for Glance Fest at Home. Um, uh, there were more panels throughout the day, and I hope you're all enjoying it. And so just a reminder that Ed Cox's would-be queen is out in June. Joanne Harris's honeycomb is also out in June. This is 2021, given that I suppose this is recorded and we'll live on the internet forever. Um, <laughs> Nalini Singh's most recent Quiet in Her Bones is out now, and Ben Aronovich's um, What Abigail Did That Summer is not out at the time of recording this, but will be out by the time you're watching it. So out now from all the good books, which hopefully open again. Um, thank you all very much for coming and have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Bottom. I am the UK editor for Seven Devils by Elizabeth May and Laura Lamb. Um, there it is, beautiful paperback, which is out April 1st in the UK. Um, so I'm going to do my best Elizabeth Day impression with these introductions, so please bear with me. <laughs> um, so, Laura first. Laura, originally from California, Laura now lives in Scotland, author of BBC Radio 2 book club pick False Heart. Shattered Minds and the Mika Gray series, as well as writing fantastic romance under the pen name Laura Ambrose. Most recently, in addition to Seven Devils, she wrote near future thriller Goldilocks, which is The Martian by way of The Handmaid's Tale. She also lectures part time at Edinburgh Napier University on the Creative Writing MA. And in addition, because none of that is enough, she's just launched a really fascinating YouTube series around solving climate change called C is it Sciotopia? Yeah, Sciotopia. Sciotopia with evolutionary biologi <laughs> biologist Dr. Shanine Collins, where they explore two possible features through a seamless intertwining of science and fiction. Um, I saw this brilliant quote that you did, Laura, on your website, which says that you write like you're running out of time because you are. We all are. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth is Californian by birth and Scottish by choice. In addition to co-writing the best-selling Seven Devils, Elizabeth earned a PhD from the University of St. Andrews and wrote the Falconer series, proudly published by Gallant, which is dubbed a wicked cocktail of Jane Austen and the Grimm's fairy tales by Sci-Fi Now. 
it is the ultimate mashup between Bridgerton and Carnival Row. Think ball gowns and blood with amazing fate and supernatural action amidst a historical steampunk setting. And she also writes amazing romance to Peter Kendrick. And now the book itself, Seven Devils. It features a small but fiercely resilient group of rebels who aim to take down a giant empire. It's Firefly meets Rogue One by way of Six of Crows or Mad Max Fury Road in space. It makes for a hugely fun feminist space opera full of complex voices and characters. So you've heard me describe Seven Devils, but how would you both like to hear it described? Laurie, Star, Wars. <laughs> Star Wars with a lot of women who are also doing gay, like being gay in space doing crime. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I, yeah, I just really describe it as uh, Mad Max Fury Road in space. That's basically the way I pitch it to Laura. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that actually leads me on to my next one. So how did your team up come about? Because you've both done solo projects before this point. You want to take this one, Elizabeth? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I had a dream that I... <laughs> <laughs> wrote Mad Max Fury Road in Space with Laura and I messaged her and I was like I had a dream that I wrote that we wrote Mad Max Fury Road in Space together and she goes let's do it and so we did <laughs> that that is amazing um what was the process of sharing the writing like I assume that the dream did not go into that much detail no, <laughs> no. um not. we kind of like we would meet in the mornings initially, like kind of synchronous and just do a lot of brainstorming back and forth and jumped about a bunch of stuff in the document. And then I think we vaguely had something resembling a plot. Um, but the first, initially it was a bit chaotic because we were learning how to co-write together. So at one point we were trying to both write different parts of the same chapter, which did not work. Mm -hmm. um, so we eventually ended up kind of splitting the first drafting between different characters and then would edit over each other so much that, you know, I can pick up a random page and open it and I'm not sure which of us wrote what. Yeah, it was, it was not, <laughs> it was quite a, an interesting process that we attempted. It was like third person omniscient kind of in the first oh, draft yeah. and then we had to fix that. it. It was a mess. It was really bad. <laughs> yes. But we were much more systematic by book two. We'd figured out our process, so it went a bit smoother. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The, so did you each then take separate characters, and then did it become more of that character-driven narrative? Because you've got incredible points of view characters. You've also got a plot that is amazingly well plotted, and also timeline as well that jump, jumps back and forth. So in that writing process, do you think that that, that wonderful complexity and those characters grew out of the shared process, the fact that there were two of you? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. We could both like approach the problem from different directions because we both had different interests and, you know, Elizabeth has her PhD in anthropology background, which was really helpful. Um, I, you know, teach creative writing, so I'm pretty good at like plotting and planning these days. So I helped kind of with the bones of that. Um, and I think like we knew the characters a bit, but through that kind of really ugly first draft was when they started really coming alive. And then in the second draft was when they got to act, like shine and we really got to know, got, got to know them and fell in love with them. Yeah. And in the second book, I think we kind of nailed down um, what, how to essentially separate the process and, and work on different aspects of the book. Um, and so then we ended up approaching that one a bit differently as well. So like Laura took uh, took one certain subplot and then, and those characters, and then I took another certain subplot and then those characters, and then they just came together <laughs> again yeah. at the end. And so then that was how that worked out. Um, and I feel like, you know, the, the first book definitely started a bit more, um, it was kind of a more organic process um, in terms of figuring out how to blend our voices, how to co-write or, you know, co-write together and also work um, around each other's schedules. And then with book two, it was, you know, um, it was doing that again during a pandemic, but also 
<laughs> also, we had the characters in the world down. And so we found the process to be a bit easier in that regard. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like there were benefits to your writing overall? Um, and possibly possibly some negatives, that's up to you whether you want to throw those in, uh, to working as a team rather than working on your own? Do you feel like it, like it will you take any lessons forward when yes, you're- Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah we, were, we were talking about this, like um, we, cause we notice each other's crutches that we can't notice ourselves. So like Elizabeth was noticing, I kept kind of slipping out of focalized third and into omniscient just for like a sentence or two and not realizing I was doing it. Um, which I kind of vaguely knew I did, but it was hard for me to like see it on the page sometimes. So that was super helpful. Uh, and I feel like just in general, we tried to be, we did something really ambitious that I don't know if we would have been brave enough to do on our own by having so many points of view and split timelines. I, I do have to say, I'm never doing seven points of view again, ever. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so I was totally on agreement with Laura about like multiple points of view. And I was just like, Laura, I'm never writing more than like two. And then now I'm working on a project where I'm like with five. And, <laughs> and so, but I do feel like writing, yeah, I do feel like writing this book helped um, learn to balance multiple characters and multiple, um, multiple plots involving multiple characters and, um, and, you know, getting their voices to distinct enough that readers can identify and tell the difference between them. So that process has been immensely helpful by writing these two. Mm. Amazing. Um, with both of you writing on it, did that affect the research that you had to do? And so what kind of research did you do? And was there anything that you found yourself Googling or looking up that maybe your Google search history would be surprising? <laughs> you want to go first or shall I go? You go, you go ahead. <laughs> um, so it was weird because I wrote this book just before I wrote a book that required so much research. It was ridiculous because it's Goldilocks is set in like the 2030s and I was trying to actually base it in real science more or less. Whereas because Seven Devils is almost at the science fantasy part of the spectrum, like there are laser bullets on page one. Do we know how the laser bullets work? No, we do not. Do we care how the laser bullets work? No, we do not. How do they have faster than light travel? Who knows? They just jump through hyperspace. It's fine. <laughs> so on that, on that kind of level, it was freeing to just kind of be like, yeah, we're just going to roll with it and do Star Wars rules. But we still did research certain things. Like um, we had to research a lot about tyranny and all of our naming conventions comes from like Greco-Roman stuff. And we chose all of the names like very carefully. Like the sub, if you want to know like an extra layer of intertextuality, just look up what each name means and you can see some little extra Easter eggs, which is kind of fun. Um, and then you researched anthrax, Elizabeth. Yeah, I did research, um, I did research kind of, you know, chemicals and, and or sorry, um, chemical dispersals in the, the air and, and how that would affect people. So that, uh, you know, specifically anthrax. Um, and I did do a lot of research on the Roman Empire. Um, and, um, you know, because I, I feel like it's, you know, in terms of like the plot, you know, we have this really massive empire and, um, you know, the Roman Empire is kind of um, analogous to it on, you know, on our planet. So it just seemed to me like, um, like it would be that kind of, of an, you know, of an empire kind of set out across this, um, across this galaxy. And so I did a lot of research on that and kind of, you know, basically like, uh, so it was the Roman empire and kind of like Sparta and just the sheer kind of brutality in which they raised their soldiers and um and that sort of thing and so it was really heavily inspired by that with um with Eris and, and Damocles um what else did I do uh research on um yeah mostly mostly the 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 Roman parts of the the culture came came from the research I did on on that and yeah. um and yes anthrax yeah how tyranny functions um, and how total totalizing totalizing I'm saying it wrong but that it can be and how it flattens everything mm -hmm. 
I think that with sometimes when you get writers that are entering into science fiction writing, I think the idea of being accurate in terms of science, which there are definitely some authors that will go down that route, and that isn't that and that's great, but I think it can be overwhelming that idea of having to know all of the things about science and technology and then place it into a future context, whereas mm -hmm. actually all of that research that you've just described is something that you might do for historical fiction or fantasy fiction or mm -hmm. any kind of just standard fiction. It's such an interesting, it's, it's such an interesting, like eye-opening way of viewing writing where you're like, it doesn't have to be this kind of over-facing all of the research before I start to write and it has to be all to do with the technology because like you say with Star Wars rules, it doesn't matter about how it happens. We know that the pew pew and then, and then you carry on with the plot because ultimately it's about those incredible characters that you created. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of anthrax, uh, <laughs> the first book, Seven Devils were written pre-pandemic but there are some strange parallels, especially as I'm editing book two with a certain virus. Um, what was it like writing book two with, with a plot that does have these strangely prescient elements to it during the pandemic? And did that influence your writing in any way? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had to throw out all of like book two's what? plot. <laughs> <laughs> the whole plot. Yeah. Because I have two books that have pandemics that both launched during lockdown and I'm very annoyed at myself for accidentally predicting the future in a very weird roundabout way. Uh, but yeah, like we tried to go with our original plot for book two and we we just couldn't do it. Like we kept trying and we were like, no, this is not working. Um, so we basically had to rip it all out and start again. So that unfortunately delayed things a little, little bit. But I do think I'm quite happy with where we ended up as a result anyway. Um, and it kind of went in more interesting directions perhaps as well. Uh, yeah, no, I remember like we were kind of working on it um, separately and then I get this message from Lauren. She's like, um, Elizabeth, can we not have a pandemic in this book? And I'm like, so like the whole book, <laughs> just not, not have the whole book. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You know, and then we had. I was writing like this. Yeah, I was writing this one scene that was like basically out of the news of people like reacting to the illness outbreak, and I was like, "This is too real. I can't do this." Yeah, and it was just it was it. We felt way too involved in it. Just it was. When was this? It was March. It was like, yeah, April, March, like right in the height of first lockdown. Yeah, and so we just, it, it, we were sad and didn't want to do it. So we decided to write something else. <laughs> well, having read book two without any spoilers, it is seamless. You would not know that, that you had had to go through that process. It's interesting that it sent you down such a creative route to try and find that workaround as well, which leads me on to my next question, which is a general question, I think, for any writer or person in general that's trying to be creative during all of this so how with your deadlines and other projects that you're working on how did you find ways to be creative spark that and boost that creativity during lockdown? Mm. I kind of came up with rituals because I think what's hard is not getting as much like impetus on your art like I'm someone who really loves to go to coffee shops and just people watch and just like be around people. Like for a while I was listening to like coffee shop playlists mm -hmm. and there was just something so sad about sitting here in my office, like listening to strangers clinking their cutlery and laughing. And I was just like, oh. This <laughs> oh I've done that, I've done that myself. I have my Spotify <laughs> playlist. And I was like, it's yeah. the same. <laughs> yeah, I was like, this is not the same. But like that soothing, you know, white noise, like it works really well for me. And I do most of my work in coffee shops in the book four times. So what I kind of had to do, because I was really struggling for a while, um, and I wasn't happy with anything I was writing, and I just like lost my motivation. So what I did actually is I turned my upstairs loft bed into my like happy place. So I'm not allowed to use any sort of internet up there. So all I can do up there is write on my laptop that has no internet, um, except for Dropbox. So it'll like sync to the internet, which is handy. And I can read up there and I can journal. And that's it. 
And I found like, I'll go up there and disappear for hours and actually get into the zone in a way that I was really, really struggling to do before. So if you have a little like corner of your flat that you can declare an internet free zone, I recommend it. That I is love that, that's amazing. Um, in my situation, I, yeah, I kind of like lost it <laughs> for a few months during the pandemic and I just could not write like anything. Um, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a really big struggle for me. Um, and then like, I don't know, around September time, I was just like, <laughs> I just noped out of Twitter. I just like deleted my account. I was like, that's enough of that <laughs> because, uh, it was because of the election and it was the pandemic and I was so stressed and, and they just, this constant anxiety and the words were not happening and yeah. so I, <laughs> and I was over here being like our deadline I know I know I know and like <laughs> yeah so Laura was like you know Elizabeth Jesus Christ <laughs> we're gonna have to write this book and I'm like I know I know um and it was just it was a struggle so I just like <laughs> anxiety quit Twitter and then um like really just tried to kind of um you know, step away from social media for a few weeks, except for Instagram and just go for walks and that sort of thing. Then I came back and, you know, worried less about the election because it wasn't a complete disaster. And then I tried this like really intense sort of organization process <laughs> while we were finishing book two, where I was just like, I set out this very specific schedule. This mm -hmm. is the character that is going on this day. I will be ha given two days to finish that character's chapter. And then they're, they're so on and so forth. Every two days would be a new chapter for me. And so I kind of worked on that. And then um, that worked really well for me. So I went even further and like have this entire spreadsheet now where I use now too it's really amazing yeah where I like do word count every day and so every night I get into my bed which is my office because my husband is still in my office now and my cats all join me on the bed and we all do writing time at at, at night and I write my words and then in the morning I sync the words to the spreadsheet and I pat myself on the back and that's <laughs> that <laughs> wow I am in awe I love the to two different methods as well of the trying to get away from wi-fi and just having that that space to be creative and then also the structure I'm a big structure fan yeah, I like data a lot and I find it um, I find it really nice because it's like visualizing data being able to see how much progress I've made has been immensely helpful so I'm gonna keep that yeah me too it's very helpful amazing what did writing seven devils enable you to do and write about whether thematically or otherwise that perhaps your previous writing didn't Ooh, that's a really good one um <clears throat> i think maybe sense of scope is probably the biggest one just because it is so much wider scale than anything i'd done before so it was really ambitious in that um and also like i don't really do much humor in my writing so that's been really nice because elizabeth usually brings most of the humor to the table like a couple of the jokes are mine but most of them are elizabeth's um so being able to kind of have that irreverence was quite fun because i tend to be very serious in my other work you know I, I i that actually surprised me because my work is generally so sad yeah but we're a bit, <laughs> i mean this one's still sad but we're a bit funny in it too it's true <laughs> you are so funny in this there are so many times where i'm as an editor i'm putting a little comment on saying like ha, 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 ha. like this how many times can i say this this is so funny and my favorite character for that is Flo. this thing that especially mm -hmm. with some of the uh, made up swear words that she oh, used oh yeah i had so much fun with me Oh, I feel I feel like I, I actually think in clothes sometimes. <laughs> so I, like, I have the like, her terminology for something. I'm just like I wish that I could just call someone a berm hole. Why can't I? <laughs> yeah, that's actually something I hadn't tried before. And it was putting something we teach on the masters into action, which is linguistic innovation, where you take 
real words, but you shift the meaning. So I just looked up a bunch of swamp terminology and I was like, what, which of these words would make great swear words? Uh, it was really fun. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was something that Laura did all by herself and it turned out amazingly well. So, um, I mean, I think that, I generally think that like, um, with my, with my own books, I mean, firstly, it definitely has enabled me to, to, you know, to write a large cast which is something that I hadn't done before because the Falconer series is entirely from first person perspective. And um, I actually found that I, I much prefer third. So I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna be sticking with that one. And I think in terms of like, you know, thematics, um, yes, lately work has taken on a very anti-monarchy uh, stance. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> yes. <laughs> History for the ages <laughs> yeah and so just like you know I started with seven devils and now I'm like yes very uh very anti-monarchy in Elizabeth May work lately <laughs> so that's a theme I'm exploring right now <laughs> I feel like that was from the start with seven devils with just the way that you laid out that world building and think even things like um the berm hole and the language, all of it just really, uh, there's such nice touches that just add to this idea of this world having been there all along and gone through its own journey before you even arrive. Just loved all of those kinds of touches in Seven mm -hmm. Devils. They were amazing, especially when you're writing on such a grand scale. It just kind of pulls it in nice and close. It does, <laughs> yeah, because I think it's, you know, it's one of those things that's really difficult about writing um, science fiction set in space is because you know, you have to kind of utilize like space <laughs> and it's so vast and massive and there are just so many planets and, and so many systems and that sort of thing. And keeping that in mind is, is really difficult because, um, you know, even I struggle with the scale sometimes. And I think we did, um, you know, we did have to keep it in mind while writing as well. Well, it all paid off because, of course, Seven Devils was a Sunday Times bestseller. So how did it feel when you first got that news? <laughs> I think I, like, I called Elizabeth and I just screamed, I think. Yeah. <laughs> up and down and screaming. Because I think, like, especially launching books in 2020, it was so hard. And, like, my other book, Goldilocks, came out in uh, April, which was an especially bad time to come out because it, you know, set up all these in-person events and then just like one by one, they started falling. Oh and, my God, it was, so it was so sad. Bad. You know, like I was going to have a launch at like Waterstones Piccadilly, which was like dream of mine and my mom was going to fly out. And so all of that had happened. And then things were a bit more open in August, which was nice. Like at least bookstores were open. So, you know, but it was still just hard to know, like, is anyone going to hear about the book? Is anyone going to find it? Um, we obviously have to give Illumicrate a big thank you because they chose it for their book box for July, which helped a lot. Um, so, yeah, but it was just it was really nice because that was being a bestseller was something I thought would never, ever, ever happen, much less in 2020. So that was nice. Yeah, it was it was definitely like one of those things that was both like, you know, the best part about 2020 and, you know, quite the most surprising part um, because, you know, it was just such a long, difficult year. And I was, and there were so many good books out that week, that month, yeah. you know, and I was just like, I was sitting with my mom and we were kind of like waiting to hear the news and I'm on the phone with her and I'm just like, I need you to distract me. Otherwise I'm just going to sit and pay, or I'm just going to pace or, or keep sitting sitting and sitting and pacing and I can't do that so just sit with me and and chat me through this <laughs> well it was amazing and it was it was like it was good to sort of see everything pay off for that book and also set up so nicely for book two which I cannot wait for people to be able to read because it's because it's a duology you get that wonderful sort of closing closing event don't you and it is an event book so I just can't wait for people to read that one as well um speaking of books <clears throat> what are you reading right now if anything uh what was the last thing that you read that was really great that you would recommend and can you recommend it to our viewers 
Laura, you go. I am currently reading Nevernight by Jay Kristoff, which is almost making me angry because it's so well written. And I'm just like, <laughs> damn you. <laughs> like the world building's really good. Um, the characters are really distinct. So I'm really enjoying that. Uh, and then a nonfiction book that was really fascinating was The Time Traveler's Guide to Medieval England by I think Ian yeah. Mortimer. Yeah. And I read that because, yeah, because I'm writing an epic fantasy. And I was like, okay, what am I going to steal from medieval land? And what am I going to not have? Like, I'm going to add indoor plumbing because I feel like it. <laughs> but it was really interesting because it just systematically takes a hypothetical time traveler through all the horrible bits of society. Um, and I learned a lot of really interesting facts. <clears throat> yeah, it's really funny because I, when I read that book, it was years ago, I thought this is the perfect book for a writer to read. I know. Is there a fantasy writer? Because it's, you can take those like nuggets of information. Yeah, it was so good. Sorry, go on, Laura. Um, it like it helped me realize like I really love the book Seraphina, and I was like, oh, that's why the dragons all wear bells because they made lepers wear bells. I was like, that makes sense. So oh, it was cool to cool see detail. what other writers had. Mm -hmm. That is really cool. I mean, I'm in I'm in research mode, so um, so basically all of the books that I'm currently reading are like pertaining to my to my current um, project. So. Uh, a lot of uh, books set during Imperial Russia. And um, my current read is called Peterborough by, uh, was it Andre Belly or something? Um, it, you know, it's set during, um, it's set in, in St. Peterborough, but St. Petersburg during uh, Imperial Russia when there was a, you know, it was a very, very difficult time. Um, and it's about a son who is constricted into a terrorist organization and is expected to assassinate a politician who turns out to be his dad. And so there's that, but it's really about St. Petersburg. And um, so that is the fiction novel I'm currently reading. And um, nonfiction I'm reading, um, very slowly kind of working my way through um, uh, the Romanovs by Simon, Simon Long something. Wait, I think I got that on audiobook. I think you recommend yeah, it, but it, I haven't listened it's like a, to it yet. It, it's, it's a long name and I'm already really bad with names. Simon Montbag Mont, Montfiori, I, oh yeah, God, yeah. I'm butchering his name. I feel so bad. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, you know, and, and that is an absolutely amazing read. It's, well, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of vaguely um, obsessed with uh, Russian history. So this is like all really fascinating for me, but it is, it is literally one of the most it has the most batshit history I have ever read. I love it. It's so dramatic and so massive in scale. And it's all, and there is never a dull moment. I highly recommend that to, as like, just just a book to read for fun even. It's, it's so fun. That sounds amazing. Mm. Well, that's it. Thank you so much for joining us for Galan's Fest at home, at our home. Um, any questions <laughs> and as a reminder paperback is out april 1st from all good bookstores and there you go <laughs> <laughs> thank you i hope everyone that's watching has enjoyed it too thank you bye, bye. hello galans fest at home viewers uh, my name is gary wigglesworth and i am the author of the Book Lovers Quiz Book. Uh, I'm here today to test your science fiction and horror knowledge uh, over uh, three categories, uh, films, TV, and books. Uh, there are eight questions in each section, and the first one is on film. So if you're ready, here we go with the first eight questions. Question number one is the first question. Which of these classic horror films was released first? Is it A, uh, Don't Look Now, is it B, Rosemary's Baby, or is it C, Jacob's Ladder? So the first question is, which of these classic horror films was released first? Is it A, Don't Look Now? Is it B, Rosemary's Baby? Or is it C, Jacob's Ladder? And question number two. Which 1968 Roger Vadim film did 80s pop legends Duran Duran take their name from? Question two. 
is which 1968 Roger Vadim film did 80s pop legends Duran Duran take their name from? Question three. There are three points available here. I'm going to name three spaceships and tell you the year that they, uh, the film they featured in came out. All you need to do for three points is name each film. Uh, so the first one, so 3A, the film was released in 1979 and the ship was called Nostromo. So the film was released in 1979 and the ship was called Nostromo. Uh, B, so 3B, this ship is called Valley Forge and the uh, the film was released in 1972. So B, uh, the ship is called Valley Forge and the film was released in 1972. And the final ship, question three, question three C, uh, the ship is called the Lewis and Clark and that film was released in 1997. So question three C, the ship is called the Lewis and Clark and that film was released in 1997. Question number four. Uh, which historical figure does John Cleese play in Terry Gilliam's Time Bandits? So question number four. Which historical figure does John Cleese play in Terry Gilliam's film Time Bandits? Question number five. Uh, Jordan Peele wrote and produced uh, the brilliant Get Out and Us. Uh, and now he's co-written and produced the remake of which horror classic due in August? So that's question five. Jordan Peele wrote and produced uh, Get Out and Us, and now he's co-written and produced the remake of which horror classic, and that's due in August. Question number six. How many Oscars did Peter Jackson's The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King win? That's question number six. How many Oscars did Peter Jackson's The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King win? Question number seven. This is a connections question. Uh, what connects the actors Elsa Lanchester in 1935, Jennifer Tilly in 1998, and Hel Helena Bonham Carter in 2005? So that's question number seven. What connects actors Elsa Lanchester in 1935, Jennifer Tilly in 1998, and Helena Bonham Carter in 2005. And the final question on films is this. Uh, in Blade Runner, the director's cut, what origami creature implies that Deckard might be a replicant? So that's the final question on films, number, uh, question number eight. In Blade Runner, the director's cut, what, uh, what origami creature implies that Deckard may be a replicant? So those are eight questions on film for you. Now we're going to move on to eight questions on science fiction and horror TV. Question number one on the TV is the first question. Uh, uh, which of these shows appeared first on British TV? Was it A, Sapphire and Steel? Was it B, Space 1999? Or was it C, Red Dwarf? So the first question is which of these shows appeared first on British TV screens? Is it A, Sapphire and Steel? Is it B, Space 1999? Or is it C, Red Dwarf? Question number two. In The Walking Dead, Rick Grimes is from which fictitious, uh, fictitious county in Georgia? So question two. In The Walking Dead, Rick Grimes uh, is from which uh, fictitious county in Georgia? And as a clue, the county was named by the um, season one showrunner, Frank Darabont. So that's a clue there. Uh, it was named by Frank Darabont. Question three on TV, and again, there's three points available here. This time, I'm going to tell you the names of three robots that appeared uh, in certain TV shows. I'll also give you the year that those TV shows first aired in the UK. Uh, and all you need to do is name the TV show uh, for a point. Uh, the first one, so 3A, 
uh, the robot was called B9. B9, and that show first appeared in 1965. Uh, so A is B9 in 1965. 3B, the robot's name, is 7 Zark 7. 7 Zark 7, and that show first appeared on, in the UK in 1978. And the third one, so 3C, the robot's name is Tweaky, uh, and that robot first appeared in 1980. So uh, 3C is Tweaky, and that first appeared in 1980. Question number four on TV. Uh, which of the actors to have played Doctor Who on television has an Oscar? So question number four is which of the actors to have played Doctor Who on television has an Oscar? And yes, I am including the War Doctor. Question number five. Uh, who is the only person to play themselves in an episode of Star Trek? So question five is who is the only person to play themselves in an episode of Star Trek? And a little clue maybe, it was the next generation. Question number six. Can you name the TV series created by Terry Nation that began in 1975 and ran for three series? Uh, the series was set in a world where most of the Earth's population had been wiped out by a cataclysmic pandemic. So question number six is, can you name the TV series that was created by Terry Nation uh, that began in 1975 and ran for three series? And in that show, uh, most of the Earth's population had been wiped out by a cataclysmic pandemic. Question seven. What is the connection between actors Jenny Ryan Patricia Helfer and Millie Bobby Brown. Question seven is, what is the connection between actors Jenny Ryan, Patricia Helfer and uh, Millie Bobby Brown? The specific connection. And finally on TV, question number eight uh, is, which German director played the client in series one of The Mandalorian? So the final question for the TV round is, uh, which German director played the client in series one of The Mandalorian. Right, moving on to books. Eight questions on science fiction and horror books. Starting with the first question. And the question is this, which of these legendary sci-fi authors was born first? Which of these legendary sci-fi authors was born first? Is it A, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin? Is it B, Octavia E. Butler, or is it C, Arthur C. Clarke? So the question is, which of those legendary sci-fi authors is born first? Is it A, Ursula K. Le Guin? Is it B, Octavia E. Butler, or is it C, Arthur C. Clarke? Question number two is an anagram. I'm going to give you the, um, the letters and I'll uh, spell it out for you as well. And this is a, a science fiction uh, or a horror author, as you might expect. And the anagram is this. Raw becomes jibe. Raw, R-O-A-R, becomes B-E-C-O-M-E-S, jibe. J-I-B-E. So all you need to do is tell me that author's name and you get a point. Question number three, and again, there are three points available here, but it's slightly different this time. Um, James Herbert, the famous horror novelist, wrote nine novels that begin with the word the. Uh, if you can name three, you can have three points. So that's question three. James Herbert, the famous horror novelist, wrote uh, nine books that began with the word the. Just name three and you can have a point for each. Uh, question number four is two of a kind. Uh, the idea behind this question is, is I'm going to describe two authors uh, who share the same initials. And you just need to name both and get a point for each. Uh, this is a Galance special. So two Galance authors. Um, the first author, born in 1965, his first novel was called Salt. Uh, and his latest, Purgatory Mount, was released by Galance uh, very recently. Uh, his other novels include Stone, Gradisil, and The Real Town Murders. And the second author, who shares that author's initials, 
is another British novelist, born in 1966. Um, his first novel was also published in 2000, and that was called Revelation Space, and his latest is called Bone Silence, and that was published by Galantz last year. Uh, and in 2013, the second author released a Doctor Who novel with third Doctor, John Pertwee, called Harvest of Time. And those two authors share the same initials, just name each one, and you get a point for each. Uh, question number five. This is an odd one out question. Which of these is not a genuine Philip K. Dick novel? So which of these is not a genuine Philip K. Dick novel? Is it A, Flow My Tears, The Policeman Said? Is it B, The, men, uh, the Man Whose Teeth Were All Exactly Alike? Is it C, The Eyes of Darkness? Or is it D, The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldridge? So which of those is not actually by Philip K. Dick? Is it A, Flow My Tears, The Policeman Said? Is it B, The Man Whose Teeth Were All Exactly Alike? Is it C, The Eyes of Darkness? Or is it D, The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldridge? Question number six. Which 1954 book by Richard Matheson was filmed as The Last Man on Earth in 1964 the Omega Man in 1971, and was last filmed in 2007 using the original title. So question number six is, which 1954 book by Richard Matheson was filmed as The Last Man on Earth in 1964, The Omega Man in 1971, and last filmed in 2007 using the original title? Uh, right, question number seven, what specifically connects the authors Ian Banks, Jenny Colgan, and Con Igledon. What specifically connects the authors Ian Banks, Jenny Colgan and Con Igledon? And then finally, question number eight. Uh, well, I couldn't do a quiz for Galance and not include a question about my favourite uh, Douglas Adams. So this is the Douglas Adams question. Uh, and the question is, uh, what is the name of the starship that Zaphod steals at its launch? Uh, the same ship that picks up Ford and Arthur as they float in space in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So my, my Douglas Adams question is, is, what is the name of the starship that Zaphod Beeblebrox steals at its launch? And it's the same, the same ship that picks up Ford and Arthur as they float in space. Uh, and, and that's the end. That's it. Uh, that's all the questions I have for you. There are 32 points available. I hope you enjoyed them. I hope you've uh, got a few right. Um, and I'll be back shortly with all the answers. Thank you, Galantz Fest at home.